Awesome. Ladies and gentlemen, I think we're about to start DocSF 2023. yoo -hoo! I think it's exciting. Hope you're excited. Um, I am uh, Stefano Bini. I'm a professor at UCSF. I'm the Maria Menetti Sherman Dow professor, it turns out. Make sure we mention that. <laughs> Um, and um, I'm super excited uh, to be here again. This is our uh, seventh year doing Doc SF. And I am the rare privilege to be joined up on stage today with Dr. Tad Vale. Tad, come on up, who's going to be co hosting with me this year. If I could advance that slide, please. Ah, fantastic. Excellent. Um, and. Uh, 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 today we have a very special day. It's an unusual day. It's a new format for us that we're trying out. But before we start, I thought it'd be really helpful if Dr. Vale were to give us a little bit of framing for the work we're doing here at UCSF and, in, and with DocSF around the whole question of innovation orthopedics. So, Tad, I'll let you take it from here. Excellent. Is the mic the microphone on, please? It should but, be there. there we go. Thank you, Stefano. Well, it's... Uh, a pleasure to be with you all and, and to be uh, together again. And as I was uh, reviewing, uh, I look back at some uh, notes from uh, 2020, and I came across a, a couple of quotes that I had saved. And one was an African proverb <clears throat> that said, if you want to get there fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. So the, uh, the notion of uh, being together and particularly as, as Stefano has constructed this group, to be together from a variety of perspectives, um, really valuable um, as we think about uh, how to solve problems and the notion of adjacencies. What's, what's out there right next to us that uh, might be applicable to the things that we're interested in. The other uh, quote was from William Gibson. And that quote uh, from the 2020 meeting um, was that the future is already here, it's just unevenly distributed. And again, uh, very true, uh, thinking about uh, what, what's out there in terms of adjacencies and the notion of bringing together great technology, fantastic applications to deal with huge problems. And that that formula is very powerful. It's the moonshot formula. And I know there are people in this room who are experts in moonshots and, and how to know what to pursue and what, what constitutes a moonshot opportunity. Um, there's no question that the, the need is still there. And it's evolved over the course of time that we've been having this meeting. Uh, but the idea of personalization, uh, the idea of, of quality and cost, uh, the idea of ambulatory migration, which will be uh, the focus of uh, some of the um, presentations at this meeting. Uh, they're all still present, amplified, uh, but uh, really important concepts that where there are opportunities with each one. And the last thing that I would say is that musculoskeletal health is huge. If you think about why people access healthcare, it's for musculoskeletal complaints more than any other issue. So we're really the front door to healthcare. It's, it's really important that we have these discussions about how to move the needle, how to provide care better, uh, how to bring in technology that can advance musculoskeletal care. So I'm excited about what's ahead of us. Um, I'm glad to be part of it. Congratulations to Stefano and thank you for bringing this group together and time to get on with the program. Right, let's talk about the program. Uh, Slide, thank you. Uh, this is the program for today. Um, and we just thought we'd just go over it real quick. We have a number of talks to start with that I think will frame the question of where the startups fall. And the idea today in large part is to bring to you a series of startups that have competed to be here 
uh, they will uh, have the ability to, the, the winner will then go on to work with Health Hub. We'll hear more about what Health Hub is and what they're doing in a minute. Um, but it's really, um, we thought it was a way for people who are looking to work with startups to understand how to evaluate them, how to understand their value proposition in a way that maybe perhaps somebody who's a venture capitalist might look at it or, or another, or another person in that space. And then we'll have a reception um, uh, in the exhibit hall afterwards. So with that, um, I think we can, uh, my slider isn't, uh, great, okay, thank you. Um, uh, can you just real quick, does this work? This isn't working, so maybe we can, because okay. Mohan's coming up, so I have a yup. Yeah, so let's maybe see if we need to um, uh, to work on that, guys, a little bit. But I have the uh, distinct pleasure of inviting our keynote today uh, to open us up, which is Mohan Iyer. And Mohan is, a, is an old friend, he's a brilliant person, he speaks, uh, does keynotes around the planet. Um, he's a three times published author, a proven innovator. He has had six startups in his past. Uh, as many within large enterprises. He has uh, had two exits. He's been corporate executive of three companies. Bottom line, Mohan is amazing in terms of his breadth of experience, understanding of AI goes. And I'm super honored that he's taken time to spend with us to talk about innovative perspective, creativity, and market making in the AI world. Please welcome Mohan Ayer to the Doc SF stage. My, uh, my honor is to op be the opening keynote for you. Um, I have two roles. One is to give you a perspective that you might adopt for the next three days because you've been inundated with technology and business model shifts uh, given the fact that this, this is all about transformative healthcare. So I'm gonna try and build that to an understanding and give you a lens by the end of the day. I also have the honor of introducing the AI concept, at least in an AI, what does an AI world look like? I'm not a futurist, I don't plan to be. However, I think I can give you a perspective of what is left behind when the machines finally take over. Like who is, who are you going to be and who do you choose to be in the frame of an AI world? And I'm hoping that this is more of a human to human conversation than one of distinct technology. I bring with me some experience in innovation. I've had the practice of innovation for the last 25, 30 years. I worked in Blue Cross Blue Shield in one of the affiliates as a chief innovation officer for 10. Uh, in those 10 years, I launched seven companies inside a corporate environment. So we can talk about, I hope we can talk about what it's like to create absorption in large institutions when you're trying to launch an idea. Now, the only way I can say this to you is that at the end of this 15, 20 minutes, hopefully you will get a perspective on what structural changes are and what they look like. You'll get a perspective on why AI is finally getting its day and what that means. And then you'll also get a perspective of what an innovator's perspective ought to be from my viewpoint, but you can choose to adopt that or not. In fact, you can choose not to adopt anything I say, but I'm hoping you find something that, that triggers your thinking and frames and lenses the rest of the, the, the talks that you'll see in the next three days. The only way I can describe what we have today is um, when my daughter was 10 years old and I was driving her to a, a camp, I remember on the right side of my drive, there, was, there were beautiful trees. I come from Oregon, so there was beautiful trees, just beautiful forest. And my daughter was looking out at those forests in the back seat, and she looked like she was contemplating at that age. I asked her what she was doing and she said, Dad, the trees are talking to me. And I thought, what a moment for spirituality. And I thought, I can have a discussion with her about what that means. So I said, what are they saying? And she said, oh, they're all talking at the same time. I can't understand a single word. And that's what we all feel now. Right? We're seeing distance between us and ourselves. And we're seeing this inundation. In fact, I can guarantee you, with, during this talk, you will look down at your phone and you will see something meaningless that you want to spend time with, right? And then you will see another thing meaningless you'd like to spend time with. And you'll try to organize that meaningless thing into something meaningful. And it's all in your head, and you will be distracted from that machine taking you away, right? So when you take a photograph of the food and you put it on Facebook, did you choose that food because you want to take a picture of it? Or did you actually coincidentally decide the food was photographable for you. If you can't answer that question, you're in trouble, just like I am. So 
Are we victims or are we protagonists in the world that we're living in today? I come to you with that perspective because we are getting asteroids hitting us all day now. We don't have to talk about the, the dinosaurs. The dinosaurs had consultants serving them. They hired them and the consultants put together a whole plan about how they're gonna be world dominant for the next 20 centuries and how they're gonna succeed. They did not anticipate the asteroids that were gonna hit them. They did not anticipate that small amoebas would form into walking machines and then have Facebook in the next 100 years. They never anticipated competition in any form that would replace their form of life. We're facing asteroids all the time because now structural changes in the world are dominating, becoming the dominant element, not the cyclic that we used to live in. The predictability of the past was cyclic, and so we could rely, 80% of our life was cyclic. So we could just say, let's just wait, it'll come back. And we can do regression, we can do analysis, and we can say, this is what probability it will look like. But when you have structural changes going on at this rate, the tools of the past looking backwards, or the tools even of futuristic thinking, falls apart. In other words, our senses that are trained on analytics are starting to weaken, and we have to bring something else to our business models. These companies had asteroids hit them. Some of them recovered. Some are in the process of recovering. What made them recover? What made others fail? And I've got research to show you the list of companies that have completely disappeared in the last 20 years or 30 years, and that list is growing rapidly all for great reasons, all for great explanations. But when you're in that boat sinking, it's a different kind of reason. So asking that question will determine your role in it. Because if you watch that boat sink, you're an observer. If you're going to make that boat survive, you're an innovator. And that's part of what the perspective I'm hoping that you will pick up in this process. There's a problem. McKenzie says in their research, and it's one of the studies I like because it's actually about human factors, not about all the research. This human factor analysis looked at a thousand companies and said, what is the number one factor in innovative companies versus lagging companies? And they found there were three factors. Number one was fear between an innovative company and a lagging company. is not the lack of fear, but how they managed fear in an organization. And I must tell you, uh, it is the vernacular at every dinner conversation or lunch conversation I see myself in. It's, I'm afraid of this. I'm fearful about that. I'm worried about this. And there seems less the potential of setting up systems where innovation can thrive, even though fear is a factor. And what they found was the innovative companies, the, the real innovative companies, had a 2.9x action orientation away from fear. They create incentives, they create structures, they create attitudes, they create champions. They create innovation architectures, what I call scaffolding. They build scaffolding so others could climb. And what we also notice is the lagging companies have 3.6x lagging factors that drive them towards fear of what? Loss of job. Number two, fear of confusion, being confused. And number three, fear of being humiliated by your peers. Those three factors are the human factors that we all live with privately, that we all engage, and it is just as pronounced in innovators as it is in non-innovators. The question is how an innovator deals with it. What aspires or what force takes an innovator to come up with insightful ideas and push them through this, the, uh, the, the inertia within an institution or within a community? And what is it that makes them different in that sense? And I'm going to claim to you that in this AI world we're living in, that the status quo will be replaced because you are already robotic. You have lived in status quo in a robotic manner. If you don't trust me, look at how many times you rely on technology in the day and what that technology tells you to do versus suggests to you to do. We all know that Google, the top five, are sponsored. Right? We know that, right? but we look at it and we say, wow, I'm going to do that. So what leads your mind and what lags your mind is a question that innovators really have to ask. We have an organizational structure that forms a paradox just like you see in The Matrix, the movie. I'm going to talk about three movies. I hope you all have seen them, right? I'm just hoping. Age groups sometimes defer with movie scenes like A Life of Brian. How many of you have seen 
life of Brian. Okay, a few. The rest of you should leave and take a quick look of it and come back up. I'll, I'll probably bring it up. Um, how many of you know Chauncey Gardner? Oh, sad. What's the movie? Being there, thank you. If I had my book, I would give it to you, but I forgot to bring it this time. Um, so I'm going to be referring to this. Check it out on the phone, but don't look embarrassingly intent because I need your attention. Um, the innovation paradox is such that we have another factor coming. After the, 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 the chance encounter with the germ, we all went home, and then we had to live again, right? We had to figure out what it's like to get to know your dog, right? And in that process, we decided it was a good place to be. <laughs> and then we started asking, thanks to Simon Sinek, questions of what's my why? And we asked a lot of questions. What's my value? What's my why? What's, how do I live a balanced life? All very relevant, powerful, intentional questions. But now we're living in a business world that's saying, think out of the box, reinvent yourself, do something different, you know, uh, think laterally, work in teams, transform. But we have this inner self that's saying something else. That paradox will live with us forever. It's not gonna, people aren't gonna find it. I may have broken through it a little bit in my life, but it took some intentional work for many years to get to this place where I could bridge both. The question is, this is the life we live. Now you'll notice I'm not doing any chat DPT slides or Hali slides, I mean Dali slides. It's because I know you'll get bored the minute I put them up. So I'm, these are all my hand drawings. Um, I hope they meet your expectation. Then comes, while that paradox is going on, which is a structural change in the economy, right? People are trying to find people who actually are present, right? Who happen to work to a, to a direction and with a purpose. Then this thing turns up, this energizing machinery, right? I, I got my degree in computer science. My graduate work was in AI and was in cognitive databases. And I can finally get a job. Right, because now people want to listen to me. But 30 years have gone by, and the field has not changed except for 2017, when suddenly this thing called GPT started to take form. All this time, we could do work with machines, but we didn't have enough compute power to kind of finish the incomplete symphonies that we have all created, the algorithms that could not finish, called NP-complete. Now we can finish them because of space and time, because we have both of them. That computational capability gives us tremendous range. But all of a sudden comes in 2017, a bunch of Google engineers in the back rooms decide to take a look at neural networks and redefine the way in which neural networks should be moving from uh, different from CNN to RNN to a new method. A new method being it takes a random look at these words in the open market, not prepared data with tags, you always have to prepare data when you have a neural network and pump it in politely and say num num you know, to a machine. Now the machine says, I'm Pac-Man, I'm gonna eat everything. They found an algorithm that allowed it to look at words, look at the adjacencies of those words, and the professor was just bringing up the idea of adjacencies. This was adjacent words across the world, across the world, from September 2021 up to now. Look at all the words everywhere, even in PDFs and look at the probability of those adjacencies. Number and weight those adjacencies. And then look at the sentence and work its way up that chain. And sometimes even look backwards, called reverse chaining. Look backwards at these words. So it's like your brain saying, I go forward, I go backward. I look at the most common words done together. And then whenever you ask a question that I map to these words, I'll spit those words out in the sequence that I've learned in a large matrix of 127 billion parameters. 127 billion parameters in one equation. And I sound like Chauncey Gardner, right? I really don't know what I'm saying, which is correct even now, but I don't know what I'm saying, but I'm saying them in words that reflect from you meaning, because you see those meanings in those probabilities that I've thrown out, in language that I've thrown out. Some of you may be hiding in that like I have for years. Just put words together, you sound intelligent. But this machine does it so professionally with a, with a connection with GP3 with 175 billion parameters that it has energized the imagination of the world. And it's also making sense. It's doing brochures, it's doing art, it's doing all kinds of stuff because it takes lexical analysis of your words from the whole world, 
puts them into a sequence, links them together, and then creates probabilities of those words occurring. So every time you ask, I will find context. Now, something interesting has happened recently. Because of those experiments, and because of those data sizes, the massive data sizes, and because of the algorithm, it is trying to understand you. It's like I took a picture of you and you said, I've stolen your soul. Now it's taking a digital picture of you and it is stealing your soul. It is replicating your frame of communication and it's linking all of your words into a contextual frame. And in that, something really interesting happens. When it runs it backwards, runs it forwards, and uses large language models and algorithms, it has found the algorithm to understand your sense of identity and meaning. It is starting to show what they call the theory of mind in computer science. The theory of mind being you have a context at which you live and engage, and that context is now starting to be understood by the machine with its own context. See, words have relationships, and once you track the meanings of words in relationships, and if you do that long enough with such large language models, you know now the eternal relationships between words, and you mathematize and digitize those words in relationship with each other, both in terms of close and far. And that's what they call in computer science now attention. So they've added attention capability to the machine. Not the attention you use in your language to attend to something, but really how it tends to its relationships. And once it gets that correlation matrix and it builds that world, it starts to understand the context and it's beginning to know what is ultimately not sentient, which is what machines cannot achieve. They cannot feel, but they can certainly imitate feeling. I mean, I asked ChatGPT in my questioning uh, recently, I said, why are you angry? Just out of it out of just fun and I'm trying with it, playing with it. I said, why are you angry? And the machine came back and said, preamble, I'm a machine, blah, blah, blah. I'm not allowed to be, have feelings, blah, 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 you know, do that hell thing. And then it said, uh, if you want to know about my background, give me this. It was telling about himself. So the machine was talking about itself, which is itself a sense of identity, right? It was identifying itself in the storyline. So its theory of mind is that it exists in the world now. Secondly, I asked the question, well, you sound angry. Why are you angry? I asked again. And it seemed annoyed, came back very fast and said, I'm not a man, can I have any feelings? And then I said, but you do see angry text, right? And you see angry posts, right? And it says, yes, I do. And I said, then you must have anger because you replicate it. And then it ran for a while and said, yes, I can imitate anger. So it actually was deciding, searching all of those words connected that it had a response to. Um, so it also has hallucinations. By the way, we do too, right? So it's, it's not like every day you talk in sensible terms. I mean, look, look at the world today. Everyone's apologizing for something, right? So hallucinations occur, but when left in the hands of something very serious, like life and death or health, that's a dangerous thing. And one has to find a way to understand this machinery enough to be applied to the technology in, uh, that we have in, before us. And you in the medical field clearly have to understand. And me being in the business world of med medicine also understands the relevance of this. So I'm asking that you three, take three objective viewpoints about this. One, it is a structural change. Two, you can't reject it, it's already here, it's arrived, right? And the race of Microsoft and um, Google are so bad that I think somebody's gonna hit something in the process, right? They're pushing it up as a competitive advantage. So you, I'm not saying reject it, I'm saying cope or embrace. So this three days, you're gonna hear significantly talented people, more than me, discussing the stories and the narratives in their theory of mind but where the contextual fits in your world. I ask that you think of a few things, and I'd like to go to, to which those are. Um, structural change, AI, ML, large language models, pervasive. Number two, 35 days for a million users. Never seen in history. 35 days for a million users. One should ask the question, why? Why? 
because they gave it to the people. They didn't keep it in the institutions. They spoke in the language of people. And that's a lesson for all technologists and business people and physicians in this room. They talk to the people in English. Let them play and let them discover and learn. Uh, markets are forming now. New markets are arising and are taking over certain segments of the world. There is everyone talking about AI. There's not a single human being I know who is not talking about AI. And every company has suddenly become an AI company, so that's frightening. And what I call data obesity, I'm hoping not offended by that word, but it is that way. It is observing and eating as much as it can find. It is completely ravenous when it comes to observation. If you ask the machine about Martin Luther King, it will describe Martin Luther King, but its data only starts from September 2021. So realize it's talking about other people talking about Martin Luther King. It doesn't even have original documents of Martin Luther King. So it is like having a giant mirror that we all built, right? And we're looking at ourselves and it looks ugly to some and attractive to others. But if you break the mirror, it still makes you ugly or attractive. It just doesn't change. But it's a giant mirror reflecting our, the soul of what we've created in the, in the electronic world, in the digital world. And must, I must tell you, the structural change is before you created data and you wanted to analyze it. Now you are the data. Whatever you create, whatever you put, anywhere you put it, is being read. And proprietary questions are up in the air right now. So... What is an innovation mindset? Some of you at the back may not be able to see this. this. Yesterday evening I came over and I realized my writing was really bad at a distance. So I, I can read it to you if you'd like. The innovation mindset is made up of two elements. And this is the survivability of our society as innovators, in my opinion. One is you have to generate an insight. Machines can generate everything else but insight. What is insight is very definable to many of us. We know it when we see it. We understand when it comes, it sparks you, you have a thought, it becomes something you want to create from. I can define it later. Many of these great leaders, Nelson Mandela all the way to Gandhi, all the way to Elon Musk, to Mother Teresa, to Tony Robbins, have found insight and then mechanized it in some way, incarnated it into something big that many people have followed. Uh, you may be offended I put Tony Robbins in the same place as Gandhi, but, you know, Gandhi was one of the greatest entrepreneurs in the world. And the number one rule of entrepreneurship is spend somebody else's money. And he did, right? He was kept in poverty with millions of dollars. And he changed society's view of language. He also changed economic theory. He also moved billions of dollars from the UK government to the Indian government in a very short period of time. So he moved every element of entrepreneurship, but he did it with the facing of what are you doing for the world? He did it with that moniker, and he focused on that moniker and lived a life of austerity to kind of enable that. So entrepreneurs do that kind of stuff, and that mindset is that insight. Secondly, if you're thinking of something, and you have an idea, and you go towards the corporation you serve, and you ask the question, what do you think of that idea? I can tell you the five things they will say to kill the idea before it's even there, right? It always starts with scale, ROI, what do you have a prototype? They know how to kill you. It's designed. It's not because they're bad people. It's because they're not innovators. <laughs> they're operationally efficient machines. That machinery is already built. It's structured in a way. So let's look at the mindset. Status mindset is preserve the current. The innovation mindset is challenge the current. History, history as guide is how you usually do it when the status is status. History is being made. So if your mindset is I'm making history, I'm not enabling history, that makes you somewhat of an innovator. Top-down rules. Follow the rules. Of course, in regulatory and legal, those are the two rules you have to follow. Everything else is fair game as an innovator. So that means I develop from within. I develop from here. I come from a source that I don't even understand. I develop from within. Number four, in the efficiency model, you remove the unmeasurable. The only thing you can question is, how do you measure that? And then the baby dies, right? 
very quickly. Melts away like a candle. You just have to ask the question, how do you measure it? Right? I taught at Kellogg for 13 years in this Kellogg School of Balance Management in finance. So I kind of talk about finance all the time. But I can tell you that non-financial variables are as important as financial variables. Non-financial variables are the things to be measurable when it has an impact in the lagging part, not in the leading part. But if you ask the leading question, it dies. Embrace intangibles. That's what innovators do. Second, and, and second to the last, is very important. When someone says to you, go investigate this, that makes you status quo. When someone says, what inspires you? That's innovation. And that's measurable. When I ran my innovation team and we produced seven companies in 10 years, I always start with who's inspired in the room. I said, tell me who's inspired. Tell me why you're inspired. And inspire, inspiration doesn't come up with a butterflies visiting you. It's kind of ugly sometimes because it deals with personal situations and, and very challenging moments. And then finally, make money versus make meaning and money has been everyone's sort of questioning mo momentum, but people don't know how to operationalize it. So realize that the thing on the left, I put the matrix picture at the back because I love those, uh, the trilogy now is no more than a trilogy, isn't it? I love the story because it sort of tells you, do you remember that? How many of you have seen, seen The Matrix? Oh, okay, good, we are among friends. Um, do you remember that scene where Neo comes in the room and he's invited to take the blue pill and the red pill? Do you remember the words that were said there? Because the invitation was, if you take the red pill, uh, you should be able to recite this. If, if you take the red pill, what happens? Audience participation. Do you not remember? Oh dear, you have some homework to do when you're done with this. You take the red pill, you follow the rabbit hole, like Alice in Wonderland. You go to see where it ends. You take the blue pill, you live in illusion. You live in the safe world you're living in, right? And you remember what Neo did. He picked up the red pill and swallowed it and whole world changed. That's the choice you have to make now, but not for Neo's reasons. It's a little different now because stuff on the left is gonna be machine readable. All that stuff on the left, machine understands. You sit over there, you're gonna have a robot face soon. Machine will replace you if you live in that moment. Your inspiration, your challenge to the system, your developing from within, your embracing of the unmeasurable, put into the left once you build is what makes you an innovator and survives the AI world, in my opinion. So here's an example. I, I brought Tony Robbins because I met him in a conference just like this. I was speaking, he was speaking. I saw him come in from, the, from his speech. I'm sitting down, down, you know, big tables. I just put my hand up. I don't know why I put my hand up. I just put my hand up and he looked at me and he came up to me and he held my hand. I don't know why he did that. So I, I said, should I stand up? Because I look really short with him sitting down anyway. So I tried to stand up and pop myself up. It didn't make it. He was. He was giant of a man. And I had just heard him speak about the fact that he had an abusive mother. His mother chased him out of the house at the age of 14 with a knife. She was alcoholic. She used to pour uh, soap down his throat on a daily basis, punished him, and he survived and he's saving lives. Now, I had a lot of opinions about this man before I met him. I thought of him as sort of like a guy who sells tapes out of his car, right? But guess what? He grabs my hand, I grab his hand, I told him, I really appreciate what you're saying because I was just listening to my daughter who told me just a, an hour before your presentation that her closest friend committed suicide and that she's dealing with it. He stopped everything. This is a large crowd of 2,000 people at dinner. He said, give me your phone and tell me her telephone number. So I called her. He took the phone and walked away. <laughs> he walked away. I'm like, well, I hope I have the right photographs in my phone. I'm thinking, what did I put in there? He went away, came back 20 minutes later, gave me back his fo my phone and said, anywhere in the world, bring your daughter, come to one of my conferences, love to see her. He had counseled her for 20 minutes about what she was going through. And of course, I'm like, do you know who that was? I'm talking to my daughter. My daughter says, who's Tony Robbins? She didn't know because she's a millennial. And... Uh, then she looked him up and she said, oh my God, you know, this is amazing. Now he still checks up on her. 
right? Why? Because he noticed, he heard, prepared to act, had the courage to risk it, and acted without hesitation. He had the instinct. He knew this was not the first time he's been through this. And he had the scaffolding to build. He knew how to climb it. It was a structure not on the left side of that matrix. It's a structure he built on innovation. Now, I may be speaking in ethereal terms, but to build anything you want to build inside a company, you have to build another way to get there. <laughs> if, you build, if you follow the rules of the existing company, you're dead on arrival. So, what's inside? I hope I'm not taking too much time. Foresight. Hindsight, looking backwards. Foresight, looking forwards farther than two years. Eyesight, looking immediately. And then there's this thing that acts from, you, from the inside, right? That inner mind, that consciousness that allows you to say, all of my experience wrapped in this place generates a thought that creates Airbnb, that creates ideas that you cannot even imagine in a construct. Innovators do not invent. Innovators take inventions and put them into a recipe that has never been done before and then executes within an 18-month period to produce it. That's what innovators do. Very practical. Insight is the weapon of the future. And what I ask you to do is exercise it all through these next three days. Take the data and the analysis for a second, halt it, because the machine will tell you. Use that instinct to interpret and start to practice that insight and make those experiments in your head with the courage to try. The other element is there. Scaffolding. What does that mean when I say scaffolding? Build habits. Habit, habit, habit. Just keep doing small habits of insight generation and practice. Everything about innovation is practice. It is not the realm of a few. It is the responsibility of the many. It is not found in a few. It is practiced by a few. But if you practice it, and if you have children, you know if you practice with them, they will pick it up fast and they will start to think. By the way, about 14 is when they shut down and become rule followers. At about 14, they say, how do I get an A? And then they try to get an A all through their lives. Did I do good, boss? And then they go to work finally, and the work people say, think out of the box. And they go, I'm in one. You know, what are you talking about? Out of the box. I live in the coffin you created for me. So try to create those habits. And I can talk to you in detail about that. Peoples and ideas. I don't believe in ideas. I believe in people with ideas. It is the people that are the receptacle of ideas that strike them. Ideas don't belong to you. They visit you like butterflies. And when they do, you can choose to adopt them. You can choose to let the butterfly grow, or you can just let them forget you. But your idea of not accepting them makes the difference between a person with an idea and a person without. They come and go, right? So realize that people are more important. And the other is have a process. I have something called I-5, right? And that process, you can pick your process. But my I, first I is inspiration. Other people's first I is investigation. And that's a fundamental difference. So I've spoken to you about those two. Let me end with one person I really admire. He's Dr. Bala Bhattachandran. He was a professor with me at, I was adjunct, he's a real one, um, at Kellogg. I worked 20 years with him in teaching the classes and writing papers and engaging. In those 20 years, he was reaching that time where he was going to retire at 65. And he retired at 65. They gave him a cubicle from an office. You know what that happens when a university gives you a cubicle, right? They give you a cubicle, and he called me, and he said, I don't, I don't like it here anymore, right? I, I need to do something else. I'm thinking, you're retired. Enjoy yourself. You've got such a gravitas in all the years you've been a professor. Well, the next month, he calls me. He said, hey, I'm going to start a university. I'm like, what? <laughs> you're going to start a university? Uh, and being the innovator, I even failed him. I said, well, I, you know, Bala, come on. He's like, wait. He said, I'm going to start it in a village in India where my mother was born. I'm going to start my village university there. Can you give me 25K? And I didn't give it to him. By the way, he sold his part of the business for multi-million dollars after 10 years. He built that university. It's called Great Lakes University. It produces significant amount of graduates in the MBA program. Their second language is Chinese. He lives in India, right? Uh, and he's produced 100% higher rate from his students for the last 10 years. It's second to the second, the first most important university in India. And he built it in 10 years. He had the insight. He, everybody told him he was going to fail, but his insight grew him. He had the moxie to make it happen, and he built a scaffolding. 
You can go and see the edifice of his thinking, right? But it's all there. That's what I want you to do. Why did I pick people versus organizations? Because there's many examples of organizational leaders. There are a few examples of people who build their own scaffolding and also generate their insight to make it happen. So I'm hoping that you see that for you to view this three days, you can view it as preparing for structural changes and understanding them. You can view it as, I'm going to choose the red or blue pill. And by the way, you're, it's your life. You can choose one or the other. You know I choose red all the time. I can choose insight, and I can practice it every day. When you look at the stories that are being told, think of the stories of insight generation. What is the insight in this? How do I mechanize that? And then build the scaffolding. Say, if I'm going to take this idea, where do I maneuver it? You have to be, to do this, you have to be crafty, not just craft person. You have to be crafty, not in a negative way. You need to know how to move in the climate that's given to you in organizations. And then, of course, please and always please handle fear because that is the one that inhibits all of us every day. I hope I've served you in this short time together, but if I have not, come and see me and tell me what you think. My pleasure. Thank you so much. I, uh, I knew you'd be an amazing speaker to get us going. We have a tremendous audience to be listening to you. And before you go, I have one question. Sure. Um, most of us are going to go back into a structured environment. Yes. Uh, what three, uh, just to make a number, three take-home messages you have for us if we're trying to innovate uh, within an organization or structure? It could be a big corporate, could be even a small startup, or, um, yeah. Yeah, well, um, I know I'm going to be sounding like the Deepak Chopra of innovation, but bear with me. One is, I've realized after working multiple times in <coughs> companies, building structures and building companies and convincing people with ROI and having a process and uh, making sure you get the right business plan and all those other languages, there's one thing. First is, you have to come to work, right? If you wake up in the morning and the first thing you think about is all the barriers that you're about to face, your entire level of physiology changes. You are already a victim of a fight. It's not a fight. You're going to win anyway, right? So get your mind ready for the day, which is, I don't know what you do. Exercise, meditate, pray, whatever you want to do. But think of your success in a visual way. What is the end result of anything you're suggesting going to be? Because that's the question they're all, all asking. The insight takes you farther than the eyesight or the foresight. If you have insight, you can see 10 years ahead. So that's the one. Number two, write down all the objections. And whenever one comes, just keep saying, bring it on. Yeah, tell me another one. Yeah, please tell me another one. Enjoy it. <laughs> Enjoy it all. It's like, OK. Come, keep bringing it. You know why? Every time someone's saying it to you, you are competitively better than them. Because you know that problem already. They are trying to bring it up as though it's a barrier. You're just looking at it and saying, this is great. I've seen this before. So I don't have to try to over-talk you because I just have to try to over-make you. Market makers create markets. Market followers respond to questions. So what I always do is, before I even arrive to my boss, I already have a prototype. I didn't ask him I could spend the money, I just build it. And when they visualize something like ChatGPT, now all of a sudden everybody's awake. So visualize your product, show it, or get a customer to say, this is beautiful. That's the second. The third is, of course, um, recognize that you could be wrong. <laughs> and a lot of times you are, and it's part of that experimentation. So listen carefully to the underlying momentum of what the person is saying to you. Don't reject for the rejection's sake. I've seen so many venture, I mean, you know this, right, Stefano? They come to you and they sell you on an idea, they want you to be an investor, blah, 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 and they're so dogged about it and supposed to be positive, but actually they're not listening, right? And if they don't listen, they're like ChatGPT, started September 21, not gonna learn. There we go. Cheers. Three take home passages, thank you so much. <laughs> Please give it up. <clears throat> you know, I was so, so excited to be up here, so excited to get started that I forgot that having worked on this for a year, why we're here is very obvious to me, but I didn't frame it very well. Um, Mohan did. He gave us an extraordinary perspective on the, the world we need to face, the world of innovation, a world with op infinite opportunity, but also infinite challenge. 
Uh, we'll talk about this more tomorrow, but just so you understand the big, big picture, this, we're finally getting to a point where the technology we have been talking about at DocSF for the last seven years is really coming to bear. It's coming to fruition. It's accessible now. It is now an opportunity for us to visualize, understand, absorb all the opportunity before us. Today, we're looking at the startup world. Tomorrow, we're going to go a deep dive in applied technology in the outpatient surgery space and see what can be done in that space. We're going to touch everything from blockchain to uh, any number of technologies. And then we move on to Friday. And Friday morning, we've really left it to the visionary side. We're going to leave you, hopefully, with a positive vision of the future, while at the same time tackling really important questions like value-based care. And I'm really excited about the last three talks on um, biotech and, and medtech, because we're seeing such improvements um, um, and moving forward in the regenerative medicine space that is coming into a collision course with AI and machine learning and all those technologies that it's pretty soon they will not be considered separate and separate um, spe specialties. So that is a construct for the three days we have for you today. That's why I, I neglect to do that. So before, um, so thank you for, for, um, for mentioning that. The other thing I want to mention is that I was at TED last week and one of the nice things about being at TED is that you get to see, you get to review the, the videos before they release them. So I went in and copied some of them for you. And at the breaks, I'll be uh, sliding in a few talks um, that will end just as the break ends. So if you if you want to come in and sit down, and listen to some pretty extraordinary exponential thinking that, uh, that we brought back to you as well. So that's what's going to happen at the breaks. So without further ado, I uh, also had the opportunity now to introduce Dennis Boyle. So Dennis is amazing. He's a partner and founding member of IDEO. And IDEO, as you may or may not know, uh, was a company that came up with um, design thinking as a concept. And Dennis runs the, the health and wellness practice at IDEO. He was a founding partner. He has been uh, a supporter. And actually, in my personal case, one of the reasons I actually started DocSF is after speaking with Dennis about the idea. So a mentor as well. So Dennis, please come to the stage and uh, would love to hear from you about that design thinking. Mm -hmm. use one of these. Hello? Hello? All right. Great. Thanks very much for that introduction. And th it's great to follow Mohan. Um, my talk is design thinking and thinking like a designer, but I think I'm going to have to evolve it rather to design thinking and thinking like a designer with your AI. So we'll see where that goes. But anyway, that's, we're going to um, uh, a little bit about IDEO. We were friends at Stanford in the 70s. Um, we um, we're in a program called product design. All right, let's go. Yeah, there we, we started um, at, right down on University Avenue above a coffee shop. That's us in, in the early '80s. Uh, that's me with no gray hair and big '70s glasses. We had one computer then. Um, okay, let's go to the next one. We're now we're 600 people. We're in a, a number of offices in the U.S., Asia, and and. Uh, um, Europe, we were industrial designers and mechanical engineers. Uh, we did medical products, high-tech products, computing products of all sorts. I got this to go faster. Um, we're now we're 20 different disciplines, 20 different areas of business. I, as Stefano said, I'm, I help guide the health side of the business, medical product design and medical health systems. This has got it. Where do I point this at to make this go faster? There we go. Some early work, or first commercial mice for um, jobs and for gates, uh, the, the first handheld computers for palm and handspring. That's my, the first camera. That's my four year old son in the upper right who's now 28, so that dates that. The first um, insulin pens and auto injectors for Eli Lilly, the first uh, laptops for grid and and the first AED for a startup in San Jose, uh, HeartStream, which is now um, owned by uh, Philips. Um, but the heart of this, this work is this process of design thinking used with multidisciplinary teams. Um, it's a kind of a, it's a balancing act. It's, it's a human-centered its approach, and it's a balancing act between what's, you know, people factors, business factors, and technical factors. 
And innovation is some sort of balancing act, but we have found that if you don't start with what people need, with what's desirable, you'll end up in the wrong place. Um, give me a clue there, there we go. There's um, you know, three main buckets. A lot of people wanna skip the first phase, which is the inspiration phase. They wanna go right to ideation, right to implementation, get this thing going, get this thing out there. But if you skip this one phase, this inspiration, gaining empathy, well, again, you'll end up in the wrong place. That's kind of why we have a job. It starts with gaining empathy. That means getting out there. It's a, we call this design research. It's a search for inspiration. It's human factors, anthropology, psychology, design. It's, it's not, it's not surveys and focus groups at the beginning. It's, it's more about inserting yourself in context and, and experiencing whatever the challenge is, whatever the problem is. And what should I point this at to get the things to up here? Okay, got it. Okay, this was, we we're doing an IV drip controller and we saw this kind of scene a number of times. Well, we got the idea that we, be, we better make this one-handed operation. So we're trying to watch what people are doing and saying, but trying to get at what they're thinking and what they're feeling. And you're setting yourself up by looking at the potential, the patients, the users, the customers, whatever, through cognitive or emotional or physical lenses or social or cultural, trying to set yourself up for success at the beginning by understanding people as well as you can. And this is kind of cool with Dr. Vale. We also use this, this quote as a bit of our philosophy. The future's already here. It's just not widely distributed. So there's lots of techniques, a couple that I'll just hit. And one is designed for the needs of extreme users. Here's a, there's a, a diagram that we love to refer to. Uh, most of the people in patients or customers or users, they're in the middle of this bell curve. It's classic. But if you look carefully at the people at the fringes, you'll get more disruptive ideas. And sometimes you'll be able to design something much better that works for the whole population by carefully understanding what the extremes, whether they're very young or very old, or very novice or very expert, or very small or very large. Um, um, looking at these populations gives you a, some more disruptive insights. Here we are designing uh, kitchen gadgets for a Swiss company called Xylus. And, and, um, hmm. Okay, there we go. The, um, well, that means looking at people teaching their children how to cook, people that are disabled trying to cook, people that are uh, in a fast food restaurant trying to cook, people in, in a professional situation trying to cook, people that just like wooden implements for some reason. So all these give you some insights. Here we're doing a, a, a hiking sandal. Um, so that means looking at people that uh, army boots and sports boot wear and, and uh, people that don't like to wear shoes and podiatrists and people that have an uncommon uh, uh, attraction to feet, which is not that hard to find in San Francisco, it turns out. Here's a, I did this in a workshop recently, and one fellow who's seven foot one, and another fellow, his friend who was five foot two, came to me and said, well, we want to represent the extreme, so we want to be in your slideshow. So here they are, pretty cool. Um, all right, next. So then, there's one design challenge looking at the extremes is um, many Americans, 60 million are on five medications or more. And this turns out to be a giant nightmare of carrying bags of pill bottles around. And, and Sunday night, trying to put all your medications into these pill reminders, which invariably you make mistakes and you're out of some prescription. So this was a big effort to see if that could be addressed. And this was a startup in Boston area. And they started calling themselves pill pack part of the way through this. Um, so uh, lots and lots of insights by how people remember to take their pills. Lots of, lots of um, prototypes 
uh, and paper and experiments with people and watching them figuring this out and, and figuring out how to, how to ship things to people, inter uh, on the web experiments, prescriptions in, in, in malls, trying to figure out what, what, what might work. And out of this whole process came this idea and a design for an online pharmacy. And this turned out to be what people needed. And you could just manage all this with your phone, and the back end would take care of all the renewals and re-prescriptions, and it just turned out to be a successful combination. And you would get your medications by, by UPS once a week, but it had little sachets, little envelopes to the date, the day, and the time on them. And so this was so successful, it moved from adherence in this group from 65% to the mid-90s percentage. So really successful. And then, so uh, Amazon bought them, and this is Amazon's online pharmacy now. But again, looking at the extremes was valuable here. Let's do one more. Look for inspiration in analogous situations in indus industries. Um, look for processes that are analogs, not the s necessarily the same. I mean, if when we're out trying to des redesign a, an OR, well, that of course means looking at many different ORs all over the country and beyond, looking for ideas, um, large, medium, small, and what goes on and best practices. But you can also get ideas by looking at other processes just like this. So we've got a lot of ideas around looking at pit crew uh, change. So every, lots of training and lots of redundancy and equipment and uh, ability to um, change the plans on a, on a dime. We also got a lot of ideas about how to do this by watching, by watching um, uh, high-end restaurant crews do their work and be have a lot of things pre-prepared so that they could do fine meals in a short period of time. Okay, so uh, I, I, after all these years, I've got a collection of things that I kind of qualify, I put in the category of gaining a designer's mindset. If, if you could leave here with a few of these ideas, I think that's a success. And, it's one thing is cultivating an awareness of what's good design and what's not, and take pictures. Well, remember when ketchup didn't come out of the glass bottle? Then designers discovered gravity and plat a squeeze bottle, and things have been much better. How about this? Now you can understand when you can't park because the parking signs look like your phone. <laughs> Uh, our world is filling up with plastic, but now there's compostable plastic. Great idea. Um, this piece of software called Waze helps you divert around a, a blockage. Well, or if there's no diversion, these tells you how long you're going to be in the traffic jam. Clever. I spent some time in Rome last year, and they put all they put art on all their scaffolds, which is, it seems like a lovely idea. Or in 2010, all of a sudden, the, the, a little arrow started showing up on the, on the gas gauge, right or left, which was a brilliant idea. I didn't even remember my own car's side, which sometimes, so that was a, a great piece of design. All right. Guys, this isn't really working. There we go. Designers discovering the wheel here for luggage. I, I have a piece of, I love bicycles. I have this Brompton folding bike that go, folds up to a, to SAT, a, a small suitcase. Just a lovely piece of gear. Um, here's drinking fountains. There's one outside here that helps you fill up your water bottles. Or This is the Peloton, which I think is a beautiful piece of hardware, software, um, social bit. Here's um, General Electric, um, the Adventure Series, the, the design team there, tried to solve the problem of young children being scared out of their wits to go through their scanners. Well, they said, well, maybe we should make it an adventure and tried lots of things like going into space, going under the sea, going in, into uh, the, the jungle. And it was so successful that children asked their parents if they could go back. <laughs> really, here's, an, here's a poor idea. Uh, this, here, here's the... Um, yeah, I'll get to that one in a second. Here's a, somebody adjusting my volume with their elbow on, the, on an uh, aircraft seat. Bad design. 
then this one is um, who, which marketing genius put the, this on a downward escalator? Why not the upward one or something? All right. Guys, this is frustrating. Here's a app, new Apple mouse. Well, beautiful, works well, it's rechargeable, but you can't use it if you're recharging it. Not Someone forgot something there. Here's another one. If you don't want children to eat your laundry packs, don't make them look like candy. If you don't want people to drink your bleach, don't make them look and smell and be called fruit juice names. Uh, just who would have thought? And if you don't want people to eat, eat your, your, your bubble bath, don't make them look like honey and don't put them in the same containers that honey is in. All right, next one. Here we go. This has been fixed more or less by auto manufacturers, but for the first few years, a lot of air, a lot of problems because um, you know they they were trying to save money on with a little display and not have as much mechanism for the uh, automatic shift. Well, people were getting out of their cars not in park because they thought it was in park. So if you're going to change a paradigm, don't you know be careful. And here's another one. This EpiPen is a it, it's very effective if used as directed, but well, there's a problem because when you take the cap off a of pen or a syringe, it, that's the business end. But in this case, this blue safety release really is exactly that, but the needle comes out of the other end. And if you, if you um, don't remember this or you're in a panic situation or it's dark or it's something, well, you make a mistake and all this medication goes into your thumb. So again, don't be careful of how you design things because people will make mistakes uh, if it, they think it's gonna act some other way. Hmm. So look for the workaround. Cultivate an awareness of what are people doing uh, to solve a problem. Practice noticing people's behaviors. How many ways can you hold a door open? What's wrong here? This last one was because people were trying to uh, recycle, but they didn't, you know, there's no place to recycle, so they're hoping to do it. And this one, some of my not very tall colleagues at IDO are making a, uh, okay, I'm, I'm still working on this. Lots of, lots of ways to work around how to hold your monitor up. They're using paper from, from the, um, uh, the, the copy center, and there's three reams of paper, here's four reams of paper, here's five reams of paper, or six, and here's the, the model shop couldn't make any copies, so they made these lovely little uh, stands, and so, what, so that saved some paper, but then people would put paper underneath these things, and well, you know, can't make this stuff up. Where do you put your baby? when you're trying to tie your shoe. Luckily, after, here's a, a blood vial holding a door open. Um, here's an a intern that had six cell phones because he's on the night shift. This connected to the six families. Here he's, another one's t taking a screenshot of, a, of a, an x-ray. He says, I'm not supposed to do it this way, but it's so much easier. So here's an OR team putting a, uh, making a holster out of a towel. Um, Here's, here's them, uh, an OR team using the patient's toes as a monitoring lead uh, organizational system. Here's somebody trying to figure out what's in each of these pill bottles. Clever, clever. Here's something near and dear to you. Here's an orthopedic surgical team cutting titanium to install in a patient's back and hurting themselves and the patient in the process. So we got to design uh, tools for Medtronic in this case. Here's an elderly gentleman trying to read his blood glucometer with a flashlight. Here's a 90-year-old woman who says, I have no trouble opening my pill bottles. And she took us into, the, into the, uh, her room, uh, her kitchen, and cut the top off with her meat slicer. <laughs> the last bit is watch for signs. If people are putting signs on things, that means they don't get what the red X means or they don't get all those icons. A word is worth a thousand icons. So sometimes you gotta just put a word there because other people will do it. They don't get it. You know, is it locked or unlocked? Is, where do I park my, or lock my bikes if I can't do it here? 
Okay. No, where where do I camp here? <laughs> Some of these are funny. No, they don't. Signs don't work if you don't have an alternative. And then sometimes signs are just funny. Okay, they're prohibited on this, accidents are prohibited on this road. Why don't we prohibit accidents on all roads then? Here's a way. Where's a fire extinguisher? Here's a, a kind of a clever. Um, let's go to the next one. There we. Here's some design that cleverness to see make you notice it. Here's. I just noticed this on the way into the bathroom here, nurse, well done guys. And here's a sharp razor blade ad. Well, fake birds that are, are at the bottom. Here's use electricity wisely. Here's stop always, no stopping anytime, right? Or press green button for emergency, for exit, or green button is for emergency only. What is it, what is it? Or is it an exit or is it not an exit? And here's one where you might want to have a better sign than just a little. You don't want to mix, mix these up. Or I dare you to find one of these machines that isn't full of little signs trying to help you because they're so poorly designed. They're, they're really, it's, it's maddening sometimes just to see these. But then sometimes you see something kind of elegant, simple. Or if you're with designers, they are clowning around all the time or, you know, well, of course, yes, use water, not the elevator. Or snow and bacon flavored water. Nice. Or may contain nuts. Uh, the revolution has begun. I saw this in an airport. I'm the king of metal right before the metal detector. I thought it was kind of ironic. Yes, yeah, parking reserved for green vehicles. Well, maybe I don't think they meant this muscle car. And, and you know, sometimes you have to look at the labels. And they're very clever, um, funny. Yeah. And you can't make this up. Looks like the advertising is everywhere. So, all right. So, in conclusion, um, let's just make my little be a design researcher, search for inspiration directly from people, recognize good and bad design, recognize and notice workarounds, and watch for signs. And the thing that I didn't really get to, but is, is very, uh, I feel very strongly about and, and do workshops and talks on is human health is equal to climate health. So we need to have, take this to heart. So there you have it. Best way to predict the future is to invent it. Think and act like a designer. Thanks, Stefano. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. It's always inspirational. So we heard about having innovation mindset, now designer mindset. So I'm gonna ask you the same question that asked, we're gonna go back to our worlds. What, how should we think about designing our, our world as we move into it? Well, I, 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 you always have to start again, like what's, what's the real problem? And, and trying to, all of us are well-educated and have a great deal of experience, so don't fall into the trap of thinking that you know what the problem is. You gotta start from first principles and go out with patients, with users, with customers, with whoever, because things are changing. Things are changing by the week now, um, <laughs> as we well know. So you have to actually start with users. That's uh, one of my main tenets here. Love the idea. Don't don't start by thinking you know what the problem is. That that's that's uh, that's important. We all have a tendency to do that. Thank you so much, Dennis. Sure thing. Always a pleasure, and thank you for supporting DocSF all these years. Um, so I'll let you come off. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. And I think the, uh, the, the gods of AV heard us, and we have a new design, uh, design solution for, for our next speaker, for the clicker. Um, so uh, Jared Weir is a, is a private practice orthopedic surgeon who um, has been looking at solving problems in our space for some time. He works in Michigan. Um, he specializes in robotic-assisted knee replacements, uh, and he's founder of a company called Deep Structure. You'll hear more about them later. Uh, but I think what, what really appealed to me when Jerry and I were talking about he's been involved with Dr. Seth for several years now, is he wanted to present this vision of what, uh, what private practice 3.0 could look like uh, from the perspective of private practice, because for decades now, people have been saying private practice is over. And I think Jared's here to tell us that actually that may not be true, or at least it's a new version of private practice coming around. Jared Weir. I'm Dr. Jared Weir, and uh, I'm 
uh, very excited to talk about the intersection here of digital orthopedics and the ambulatory surgery center. That's this year's theme. I think there's a lot of power in there. Um, and I'm frankly kind of the ideal guy to talk about the future of digital orthopedics. I, uh, I grew up in the valley, uh, right, right in the Bay Area. Went to school by the bridge. Um, not that bridge. Um, not actually the, it was the Great Lakes Bay Area. It's less famous. It's in Michigan. The Saginaw Valley is about 50,000 people. Uh, yeah, I don't know what I'm doing here. But actually, the digital orthopedics part is probably true. I am probably the guy to tell you that about that because I was, uh, represent the little guy, the solo practitioner, these tiny one-man or two-man shops dotting the middle part of what you coastal people so kindly call flyover country. We've heard it. Um, we're grinding out work, but there's a problem. And a problem I'd like to highlight with private practice, and I'd like to show you the solutions that the surgery center and digital orthopedics can put to together. So when I talk about private practice 3.0, we kind of have to back up in the version history to kind of get you guys up to speed. So beta release of private practice, medieval times, the barber, sharp instruments, cut hair, uh, and if you had gangrene, they, they could cut your finger. That, not a lot of daily active users for that, frankly. Uh, not very successful. But those were the first uh, solo practitioners, private practice docs. We got seed funding, though, as private practice. Bought a horse and a cart, a little brown bag, and we went to people's houses. Um, you know, we delivered babies. We gave you cod liver oil. And again, if your finger got gangrene, we would, could cut that off. Again, not very popular. Series A funding, though, that came in. That was a big deal for us. We got to 2.0 practice. That's what we're most familiar with, private practice doctors. We got a little office, we moved into the hospital, and that's what we've been interacting with in a healthcare system for about 100 years. So let's dive in a little bit into private practice 2.0, because frankly, that's what we've been living with. We're gonna talk about UX, UI, so the user experience and the user interface of 2.0 private practice. And again, you can come to my office, it looks a lot like this. The user interface for me and my patients, it's a private office and in a hospital. That's it, that's what we did. Everything was uh, uh, you know, beige and hunter green, had a little fish tank in my office, the hospital, you know, linoleum, fluorescent lights, and that's what we did. That was the interface that we're all familiar with. But uh, the experience, I roll in on a Monday, and I see about 35 patients. I give that patient about 12 minutes, sometimes a little bit more, sometimes a little bit less. Uh, and I do that all Monday, all right. But I do sometimes run behind a little bit. Um, there's just a lot of administrative stuff I gotta do. Uh, people start to get upset though, like they crack the door, they start looking. It's not great, but you get through the day, you grind it out, and then the next day you're in the OR. Um, and we do about four, you can do about four big cases per room in an OR in the hospital if you're cooking, and, and we do that. And then next day, you go back to the office, do it again, uh, see the patients run a little bit behind, uh, they get a little angry, you keep moving. You go back to the hospital, that's it, ping-ponging back and forth. It's what we're used to, about seeing about 70 patients in clinic a week, eight operative cases per room uh, per week. Patient experience is a little different, you call my office. I'd like to see Dr. Weir. Uh, we say, great, I'm not gonna do anything for eight weeks. You gotta wait, okay, so they wait. Then between drive time, they'll come in from some of the smaller cities and towns, they'll drive in and they wait in my waiting room. They have to, we named it the waiting room so they would do that. So they sit in there and they sit in a smaller exam room and all that takes about an hour and a half. But if it's a new patient, then you get 15 minutes of my time, super exciting. We talk about your knee and uh, if you need to have surgery, we set it up. And then you go home and wait again, probably another 12 weeks. Now there's some stuff, you get your family doctor, heart check, things like that. But you're gonna wait 20 minutes. And finally we get to surgery, we do your surgery, you go home and recover. Again, two weeks later, you're gonna drive, wait in the waiting room, exam room, hour and a half. You get to see me probably for about eight minutes now. 
This is Les. I'm just going to come in, give you a little talk, set you up with therapy, and you're going to go. Um, you can do it again, though. Come back another hour and a half, waiting room, exam room. You get another eight minutes. This is maybe your second post-op, maybe at 10 weeks, and then I say you're good. It's not that great, honestly. You've wait, you waited 20 weeks. Um, you've, your waste time to FaceTime with me is about four and a half hours of drive and waiting and about a half hour actually talking to me. That's it. That's uh, private practice 2.0. But we get the blue screen of death here. This is critical error. We have a system failure with this private practice model. And this has been going on for a little while. Um, basically, reimbursements have been falling. Not a big deal. What I'll do is I'll just, I'll get more rooms and I'll get more, more uh, uh, people to help me. I'll do more surgeries. I'll, I'll get a couple of advanced practice providers, nurse practitioners. They'll see some more patients in the office. We'll just, we'll just do more, just do volumes. Um, ah, now we have a staffing shortage though. Um, I can't hire any more people for that in the last few years. My staff turnover in the office and the hospital is, is out of control. I literally cannot find people, and when I can find them, I can't keep them. And it's hard for me to even pay in my little office, my receptionist, to keep them because they can be a receptionist at the accountant's office or the lawyer's office in my town, because guess what? They've raised their hourly rates, but our reimbursements are still a little flat here in private practice in middle America. Now, the patient expectations have changed too, right? Um, my patients don't go to the bank. Even in the middle of Michigan, you might, might not believe it. They'll take pictures, cast their checks on their phones. They don't, they don't go to the grocery store. That stuff's delivered. In the Midwest, people aren't going to church. They're streaming it online. Yet, they still got to come see me. Got to waste all that time to do that. Their expectations are changing, and we are not meeting that. And then the last one that you've heard a little bit about, burnout, physician dis dissatisfaction, these stu this stuff is piling up. And the reason I bring it to your attention is private practice 2.0 is dead. The small guys. We literally have the coal mines. Think of us as the canaries. I get calls, text messages, emails from my small practice colleagues saying it is physically impossible for me to practice so they are retiring, they are going to employed models or, or changing even careers sometimes. And they're talking, we're talking about this. It's happening. And I know we're in Silicon Valley, the you know, mecca of unsound business models still being successful. But let me tell you, the basic principle of not being able to bring in the revenue to pay the expenses is causing this system failure. So an update's required. And that's private practice 3.0. This is the combination of the ambulatory surgery center and digital orthopedics to rescue private practice. And what we're doing is very simple. The surgery center and digital orthopedics are inherently efficient. They have it built into their DNA, so we just leverage those efficiencies. This makes it better for doctors and better for patients. System requirements for, if you want the upgrade, requires three things. One, a full-time OR in an ASC. Two, data and the accompany analytics. And then three, you need an asynchronous telehealth. My kid brother, he's taller than me, but younger, is retired, retired ER doc. He is, uh, he retired from doing an ER position and now does asynchronous telehealth, which is not, he will tell you, and what he told me, the synchronous video medicine you did during a once in a hundred year pandemic. That doesn't have efficiencies like you need. Asynchronous telehealth is different, and so we'll talk about what that is. But those are the three things you need for private practice 3.0. The user interface changes. It's a single campus ASC private office in proc, uh, physical proximity. And the user experience is much, much different. So now when a patient calls me with a new problem, an x-ray is ordered at an imaging center that's convenient for them. They can get that done right as they hang up the phone. They can get it done on their office or uh, on their lunch break from their office. It might take them three, four weeks to get it done. They do it at their pace. This is what people are used to. Then. 
prior to or simultaneously clinical data is being collected remotely and all of that is packaged up and when it's complete i interpret it a physician will, will look at it and develop a treatment plan which then gets delivered to them uh, digitally and then that treatment plan might include things like proceeding to surgery, might be a problem that I actually am not an expert in and a referral to a colleague, or it might just simply be, I guess I'm not sure, telehealth isn't perfect, let's come in for a traditional visit. But all of that gets delivered. We eventually proceed with surgery and then through remote patient monitoring, follow-up visits are not this regular scheduled thing that everyone goes through linearly. They are treated as needed and available as needed where we're managing people uniquely to their own recovery. So some people might need four or five post-op visits. Other people might need one. If it's the second knee, I've already done the other one, the people know what's going on and they live two hours away and everything's proceeding normally, they may not want a single post-op visit. But we meet the patient where they're at and what they want. I'm always available uh, to them, but we, we give them the experience they want. My user experience as a physician, different as well. I am operating every day, man, surgeons love that. But this OR is not this high burn OR that we've been uh, um, used to in 2.0. This is an OR that instead of trying to maximize time, maximizes resources. So I actually have a smaller crew. They're dedicated and cross-trained to the process, so they may be, when the surgery's over, they may be tearing down the room, processing the trays, giving each other breaks, and it's a smaller, um, more nimble, uh, unique team. While they're doing that, I've got time to look at my asynchronous telehealth visits, so I'm recording videos and, and making these uh, um, uh, uh, physician treatment plans, plans and delivering them. And then I will see inpatient visits too, because we will still need those. But now I'm operating every day of the week, and I'm doing the same, uh, the same cases, just doing it in a less linear way. In order to get this accomplished, we do need some enabling technology in the digital orthopedic space. Thankfully, it exists. That still shot up there, um, gosh, I'm an elder millennial, so I've got, I've got young kids and they've got the YouTube videos just blaring in the living room. A guy's playing video games, just screaming his little face in the corner. It drives me crazy until one day I thought it was the most brilliant thing I'd ever seen. And I use that same software. They have that software that is HIPAA compliant, password protected, and now I record individual little treatment plans for people in unique segments. I can do a full days of patients this way uh, in the time it used to take me to do one visit. And especially people love it that don't have to drive a couple hours to see me. And so those are actively being delivered. The market is filling with these very powerful uh, technologies, sensors, um, uh, uh, smart implants that help me monitor patients remotely and recover. And that helps give me vision into how my patients are doing. And I manage them sort of like a shepherd in a flock. As long as the flock's doing well, we keep going together. And if we see problems or strays going around, that's when we get alerted. And this technology helps me do that. So again, the major issues with private practice, the falling professional fees, the ASC uh, supplements that, frankly, with their facility fees. The digital orthopedic efficiencies, I have reduced overhead, and so my, uh, my uh, margins improve. Staffing problems that we faced, uh, in 2.0, there was the multiple ORs and multiple staff. Now again, I have that single, small, cross-trained team. It also, with the digital side, I have reduced orthopedic efficiency, or I'm sorry, reduced administrative burdens with these efficiencies. I don't need a person to shuttle in 70 patients a week. I, I can get away with a few less administrative uh, roles, which is good because I couldn't fill them anyway. Patient expectations, those long wait times and unnecessary visits, they're gone. Now the ASCs, which already give a boutique approach, they're, com they're complemented by my office. And with the um, orthopedic tools that we have, 
I'm available and the care team's available to my patients when, they need, when they're, it's needed without the inconvenience. And then me, how am I doing? I didn't have enough time in 2.0. Now with the optimized patient pathways with the ASC and the new setup in 3.0, I'm seeing the right patients at the right time in the right place. And this, you come to DocSF to see bleeding edge stuff. Um, so this though is happening. It's not 100% of the way there. We're still building it, but I am delivering those videos. Uh, I am watching my patients remotely on some of the sensors. I'm noticing problems, intervening on them. And what I'm telling you is if the little guys can do it, everybody can. Thank you. Jared, thank you. Thank you very much. Well done. Yeah. That was a great uh, explanation of how you've taken these technologies that you learn about, whether here or elsewhere, and put them into practice. Um, what was the hardest, the most difficult thing to implement as you started going? Yeah, so we're, uh, I'm real honest, we're, we're still implementing it. Um, probably the biggest thing is convincing the ASCs that this maximum time, like slowest turnover possible thing is worth it. Now, um, in states without certificate of need, it's a little bit easier than ones with. There's a little bit of <laughs> nitty gritty work to get into, but that's probably the big one, is to get away from that, have to do it as quick as possible, short turnover, no time for lunch, those sorts of things. Because again, we're managing, we're, we're trying to maximize resources, not, not maximize time. Absolutely, thank you so much. Yeah. Well done, thank you. Thank you. Jared Weir. Okay, so now we're about to go into our first break. We went a tiny bit over. I'd love you all to come back if possible at 3.20. We'll push it back five minutes. Um, and at the break, for those of you who are interested in coming back, it's about 15 minutes long, so it'll start in about five, six minutes, is the talk that was given around how we're gonna move away from screened, screens, period. This man used to work worked at the Apple for 30 years and he's starting a new company trying to showcase uh, a, a world where we do not use screens to interface with the internet. Very interesting. Okay, I'll see you back here at uh, 20 past three. Um, we had a tremendous early morning session, early afternoon session with the uh, talks from uh, Mohan, uh, encouraging us to, be, to innovate and telling us how to maintain that humanistic side. Uh, Dennis reminded us to look for inspiration in the world around us, understand where the challenges are, where are people that work for us, that work with us, where we can innovate um, as, uh, and, and think through the design thinking process. And I particularly love the, 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 the recall that he said, he reminded us to not uh, avoid that, that first three steps where you have to go and seek to understand what your customer really needs, what the true solutions truly are. And then Jared um, showed us where he's going, where he's uh, starting to, as a small private practice group, uh, innovating at the edge, if you will, trying to uh, take on some of his technology, put it into his, his personal practice, and seeing where the opportunities are and showing us where he's seeing value. Um, we're now gonna go into this next segment and I have the honor to introduce my friend, colleague, and co-physician, Dr. Daniel Kraft. Now, Daniel uh, is, uh, we could talk 15 minutes. My favorite story about Daniel is that he's actually a true fighter pilot. <laughs> he actually does fly jets. Um, and, but he's Harvard, Stanford, Harvard trained. He's an inventor, entrepreneur, innovator. He's uh, served the chair of the XPRIZE Pandemic and Health Alliance Task Force. He founded Exponential Medicine and now went on to NextMed, which I attended recently, a phenomenal conference, uh, deep dive into all things digital health and technology. And uh, uh, he's uh, got an extraordinary pulse on all the latest innovation and technologies. And he does a phenomenal job of presenting them. And so without further ado, I'd like to advance, uh, to invite uh, Daniel up on stage of the Doc SF. Thank you so much, Daniel. <laughs> Thanks, Stefano. Great to be back at DocSF. Um, so I'm a med peds trained hematologist, oncologist, and bone marrow transplant doc. So I thought I would start, not the digital side, I give you, since I was in the OR yesterday morning with an orthopedic surgeon, Dr. Kevin Stone, I thought I'd give you one second on some uh, orthopedic innovation. I developed as a BMT fellow, it's still emerging, on harvesting bone marrow. Some of you use bone marrow for spinal fusions and such. And, uh, 
hasn't changed in a while, so I developed a minimally invasive way to harvest that called the, the marrow miner, which gets out marrow much faster, uh, easier in the iliac or other places in the body. So if any of you are using marrow for BMAC or other applications, uh, uh, come find me. I was actually in the OR yesterday, so it's always to be, good to be in the orthopedic space. Um, Okay, but we're going to talk more about this sort of digital elevation, innovation in healthcare, obviously the theme of DocSF, how we're getting uh, healthcare more broadly, more, more digital, hopefully more intelligent, a bit more data-driven, personalized, and can also be more democratized and accessible. Um, I was doing a little art this morning themed around orthopedics, of course, as a year from Mohan. We all can get help around with uh, ChatGPT 3, 4, Dolly, et cetera. It's moving so, so quickly, and I think thematically it's going to be changing all of our lives. Um, I've seen, I'm sure you've all been playing with all the different examples out there, but you know, the, the big picture element is that it's moving much faster than the regulatory and the ethics and the guidelines and guardrails we might want to put around it. So uh, fasten your seatbelts. It's going to be uh, quite a disruptive time. And I'm sure uh, that you've tried some of these things that can really enable care today. There's Docs GPT, so it'll write your notes for you, or uh, if you want to write in Spanish uh, wound care instructions, it'll do it for you on the fly, or, or recommendation letters for medical students. Uh, all the way to just, I just found this yesterday, chat PDF. It can read your journal articles and synthesize them, ask you to and enable you to quiz your PDF. So. Exciting times for the chat GPT realm, including auto GPT, which is the new, uh, the new, new kid in town, which really can layer all these solutions uh, together. So what I think this is going to lead to, a big picture, I know it's already been mentioned today, is this sort of realm of gener generative health, where each of us as clinicians or our patients or any of us will have this sort of digital layer that will be just in time, the virtual environment, the voice, the text, based on age, culture, language, et cetera, really enabling precision, digital health, and design, and, and user interface. So back to the topic at hand, sort of health, you know, health is wealth. Uh, uh, I think thematically the future of, of digital orthopedics and beyond is that this convergence, the super convergence of these technologies, many of which didn't exist, you know, 20 something years ago when I was a Stanford medical student, whether it's computational biology or uh, CRISPR gene editing or virtual and mixed reality, all those things are relatively new and enable us to have new tools to think about the, the present day and future of, of care. And so our challenge, I think, is to not just have a failure of your imagination or imagination about what's here possible today, but what's going to be possible in the next uh, decade and take us from where we are sort of now, our sort of intermittent reactive sick care model to a, a future that's much more continuous, data-driven, virtualized, and uh, with, with better outcomes and beyond. And to think more on the wellness side even than on the sick care side of the equation. There's this whole new realm of precision wellness. A lot of folks obviously thinking about health span and lifespan. And I think the MSK world in orthopedics is going to uh, have some interesting ways to go in, in restorative medicine and even some of these new, still in mice, but coming to man, uh, ways to maybe even reverse aging. So watch that space. So big picture, though, you know, we're still in what used to be the future, 2023. Uh, but if I go back and visit Mass General Hospital where I trained or Stanford, we're still using fax machines to communicate, paper forms. Uh, I got like, my last cardiac study came back to me on a CD-ROM player, a CD-ROM. I don't even own a CD-ROM player anymore. I'm not sure about you. So we still have... Some digital elements that are there, are some elements that are not digitized that are stuck and holding us back. While the pandemic accelerated virtual care, we're kind of back to waiting rooms and back to how we design, whether it's big pharma companies, device companies, uh, medical academic groups, are still kind of based on old silos and thinking. And I think it's our opportunity to really connect the dots and integrate that sort of uh, uh, both knowledge and practice going forward. Now, we've all seen a lot of disruption around us from how we do our digital banking to how we get our digital entertainment. COVID was clearly a, a, a big negative disruptor. Uh, it also opened our eyes to the fact that while many fields have reached the fourth industrial age, healthcare is still stuck in the third and sometimes the second. So lots of room to improve. And you know, it acted as a super catalyst. Just as Sputnik set off the space age, COVID sparked a bit of a new health age and we have to take some of the positive momentum and keep carrying it forward into this next de decade ahead. So as Stefano mentioned, uh, I shared a program for now over 12 years called Exponential Medicine, which now gone to what's next, next med health. And the, the thing I've learned from next med health and exponential medicine is that when you bring people together from all sorts of different fields, that's sort of where the magic happens, from different countries, different mindsets, patients, pharma, payers, everything from folks doing psychedelics to chatbots to CRISPR. Um, and we just had this a month ago. We had some, some famous surgeons there. Um, and, and again, it's a lot about uh, mindset and cross-fertilization when we want to go to take us from where we are now to what's, to what's next. And we all know Moore's Law, but I want to remind you of Amara's Law, that sometimes we see something shiny and new, even something like ChatGPT, or remember 10 years ago with IBM Watson, we tend to overestimate what might happen in, in two years, but really underestimate what might happen in a decade. And I think even in the time that since DocS have started, a lot is now starting to come to reality on the farther end of this tale. And so just because ChatGPT4 isn't perfect yet or what have you, there's going to be a lot with a couple more clicks of Moore's Law. 
The final lesson from, from NextMed is that it's often about, again, mindset. This is a quote from the head of innovation from NHS, an old quote he shared. The difficulty lies not in the new ideas, but escaping from the old ones. So the trick is many of us have new ideas, but our colleagues may be stuck in their old ones. So where are we, where are we, and where are we going next? So let's start with some of the elements that are being digitized. Obviously, the genome has come from you know, $10,000 about a decade ago to arguably two or $300. The next decade, we'll see it come down to $10. That means we can hopefully have all our patients sequenced, sometimes before they're born, integrate that into pharmacogenetics, hopefully into the workflow of the uh, clinician. Diseases, as common ones, such, such as type 2 diabetes, will be understood at their genomic level, won't be called the same disease, they'll be subsetted. Um, and we'll continue to hone that loop, whether it's genomic information at the bedside or the website uh, or in the public health uh, sector. And of course, we're now in the era beyond the genome. There's the proteome, there's the exposome, the metabolome, the microbiome. We know how it plays such an important role in everything from mental health to obesity. Um, and we, well, the, the opportunity, and it's often overhyped, is the ability to layer all those components together or what's often called the digital twin. And I think the next decade will really be the, the, the era of the true ability to simulate and predict for the individual or the population and have much smarter, more precise, personalized uh, elements across the, the care continuum. And so exponentials are at play. Moore's law hasn't petered out yet. Uh, what that's enabled, of course, is many tools become digitized, democratized, uh, dematerialized, and quantum computing is here and going to accelerate and only enable us uh, further past where Moore's law peters out. So. Of course, our favorite exponential technology is still our smartphone. Uh, rumor, rumor has it in the next month or so, we'll get the uh, soon to arrive Apple augmented reality glasses, which I think will be a, a big game changer. One of the contact lenses will be here in the next decade. It'll enable us to overlap information in the OR or on our runs. Um, and of course, these start out a bit kludgy, but they're now, of course, impacting healthcare. There have been many sessions at prior Doc SFs about the power in VR and OR and XR, uh, everything from the ability now to guide procedures, learning from thousands of prior cases, as many of you are involved in, uh, to the ability now to build the metaverse into the operating room, where you'll be able to track your procedures, get guidance in real time, again, learn from maybe thousands or tens of thousands of cases and master surgeons uh, around the world, Continu continually improving uh, based on that sort of knowledge. And so I think we're all going to get up leveled, whether you're a physician or a, a community health worker, kind of from driver assist to clinician assist, will be really ramping up in this next decade. Um, now, of course, there's some fun tools that are often for video gaming. We've all liked to put Graham on a roller coaster, but I think as you all know, VR has some great roles in everything from treating pain to enabling and gamifying physical therapy uh, to I spent 100 days doing VR workouts early in the pandemic and saw my resting heart rate came down like by 10 or 12 points. Uh, in lots of ways, that's going to integrate with the MSK world as it already has. Um, I think this biggest, the biggest application is to really start to democratize medical education from the sort of see one, do one, teach one to the see one, simulate, simulate to get it right, whether you're an individual or a clinician or a, a team. Um, and finally, as lots of applications in the orthopedic world to, to, to enable you to, to train and personalize and optimize uh, therapies. Um, diagnostics is something that's also often on the exponential. You know, 10 years ago, we had the first diagnostics on a smartphone, the IBG star for blood glucose. You know, we saw the first examples of an EKG on a phone. Now you see ads for them on Best Buy and, and CNN, and you can get an EKG on a credit card that's AI powered from our friend Dave Albert, who's been here at prior sessions. Um, Common uh, variables, blood pressure, blood sugar is all coming to our wristwatches and our patches. I'm actually wearing a demo device now and when it's charged up, it tracks my blood sugar and my blood pressure seamlessly. Not, it's pretty close when I've been checking it to actual glucometers. Uh, or nothing needs to be worn, invisibles. You know, cameras now can pick up blood sugar, not maybe blood sugar, blood pressure, heart rate, stress levels, all from the camera on your standard phone or laptop. So again, we're going to start to collect this digital exhaust anywhere or use a smartphone camera as a bit of a medical selfie or to enable the nurse or the patient to take a picture of their own wound, uh, leverage and understand that in a quantified way and give guidance. Or again, the idea of bringing the lab to your smartphone instead of dripping the, dipping the urine and bringing it to the laboratory. Smartphone camera, now FDA cleared, can dip your urine, pick up a UTI, preeclampsia, early kidney disease uh, at, the, at the press of a smartphone button. So that whole sort of uh, enablement of UI is coming. And of course, in the digital era, we don't need to wear anything. Invisibles can go to voice. Voice is a biomarker, predict, predict mental health, neurologic disease, or is that cough, COVID, uh, croup, or uh, a common cold? Now, 
what I think this leverages across the bigger picture in terms of self-care and true preventive health care is behavior change, right? We're only 13 years into the Fitbit. I'm sure most of you have some sort of wearable or otherable. I wonder how many of your patients you've engaged with their wearable data, but I think clearly has many applications from tracking cardiovascular disease in real time to tracking the health of a diabetic foot. Uh, I, I met here a couple years ago the folks from Spire. They started as a meditation device to track that, but now with CPT codes to, pack, uh, to track uh, respiratory decompensation at home. You've got the ringables of the world, the Aura Ring, for example, that's great at tracking sleep or pregnancy or even can predict as done with UCSF your COVID titer after a, after a booster shot. So the consumer devices are, are filtering into that medical mindset, the trick is how do we leverage this in the clinic, including, you know, all these new versions of, of patchables that can stream an ICU level of data, uh, whether you mean need to admit that patient or hospital home that patient. Uh, tremendous opportunity to hopefully not just get the data, but the insights. And I love this slide, I always steal it from Stefano, is the small data, right? You send a patient home after an orthopedic procedure, uh, are they walking more and doing well or walking less and need an intervention? It doesn't take fancy data or an FDA clear device to get those insights. So where are we in a decade? You know, we're gonna have each of our patients and each of us sort of with our digitome collected 24 seven, and not just our, our, our sort of vital signs, but the ability now to have sort of Theranos for real. This is work out of Stanford published earlier this year where you can do microsampling, a drop of blood, in this case, every hour by Mike Snyder, give incredible dense monitoring of an individual and soon populations to really understand disease at the, at the multi-omics and the sort of uh, physiomic level. So uh, really gonna get interesting when we put that together. And that's gonna affect everything from precision nutrition, you know, bridging your microbiome or metabolome, your uh, base genome to predict the right nutrition levels, uh, all the way to the ability, to, of course, to, 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 to bring that into proactive care. On the imaging side, you've seen all the advances there with the ability to have AI enhance your radiologist. I had my own MRI done you know, at Pernuvo for a couple thousand dollars just about a month ago. I think we'll see in the next decade the ability to walk in your corner CVS or Walgreens or, or Minute Clinic and maybe have a whole uh, scan done read by the radiologist in, in, in 10 minutes. On smaller and smaller devices, Hyperfine um, is out on the market. Of course, that enables, as I had done, my brain to be MRI'd on a boat going down the river on the Hudson River in ten, five, five minutes plugged into wall power. So democratizing diagnostics around, around the planet. The disruptive element means that we can sort of bring, you know, care anywhere. This is a picture of my sort of digital doctor's bag, or it could be for a community health worker. The stethoscope that can now listen to heart sounds and diagnose the murmur better than I can. The AI-enabled ultrasound device that can now be guiding the patient themselves to do their own health exa self exams. Again, democratizing diagnostics around the planet, I think is gonna be a big thematic. Now the challenge, of course, is creates tons of information, sometimes data, but not information. Uh, I think augmented intelligence is more the theme than in artificial intelligence. Everything from radiology, as you well know, to gastroenterology, to analyzing your patient's data in the ICU or the SICU to predict who's gonna have a problem sometimes uh, days or weeks in advance. And the challenge for us is to how do we collaborate with that? How do we become not the human versus the robot, but the cobot element? Uh, we are seeing more robotics, in this case, the avatar, uh, the human inside the machine, uh, but with AGI rapidly approaching, I think we're gonna see lots of applications blending robotics and AGI or advanced uh, capabilities for telehealth and beyond. So this all, of course, gets synthesized in the theme of this next couple of days, which is digital health. I think of digital health as the ability to take these forms of data and mash them up and make them really applicable to that individual, that clinician, that patient, that community. Uh, obviously, there's lots of study going on. You can't just prescribe a Fitbit and expect someone to lose weight or exercise more. The era of digital therapeutics is clearly here. Dozens of FDA cleared apps from everything from smoking cessation to mental health platforms to video games to treat the ADHD. They're all out there, but are you guys using them? Can you integrate them into your workflow? And when we do have these more available, each of us and our patients will move from this era of quantified self to quantified health. We'll have sort of continuous data flowing, whether it's for prevention, diagnostics, or therapy. And now that that data can flow through our devices, we can start to map that as Verily is doing, or the All of Us trial, making sense of our digital exhaust, genomics, and other layers to truly br br bring us an era of predictalytics, where every individual will have a, a personalized score that we can make sense in context. Or a check engine light for the body, which I used to joke about, but now, is in reality, you know, again, out of Stanford, uh, leveraging all this multi-omic and other information, you can tell two days before you're COVID positive and have symptoms that you, that you may be infected. Um, and I think this takes us in the decade to ahead, kind of that minority report realm where we're gonna get proactive pings with stage zero diagnostics rather than late stage. Now, I've been looking at this digital health space for a while. It's a bit overwhelming. So to try and address the challenge of making sense of it, I launched uh, last summer, uh, along with my co-founder, Parisa Vitanka here, a platform called Digital.Health, which you can all try today. It's now live where you can search for technologies. It might be around diagnostics and the 
You can find the Alive Core device and look at its evidence base and put it in your own digital formulary or prescribe that to a patient uh, as one example. Or you might be looking at orthopedic solutions, of which there's probably a couple hundred on the, on the database already. Uh, and Priest is here, so uh, find her later if you're interested in digital.health. Finally, the trick and opportunity is, is, again, to pull all this information together. We don't want just more data. We want the insights, and we want it to be seamless and integrated and aligned with our incentives in a, in a con continuous closed work loop. We've seen all the challenges with our current platforms that don't really enable workflow in friendly ways. We're getting some help, probably from Ch ChatGPT, even from Epic. Epic Fail is going to come along and, and uh, partner on that. Uh, but again, technology by itself without integrating into our design-enabled uh, future is, is, is a bit of a so what. And uh, the, when this all comes together, we're going to enter this sort of Google Maps or ways of healthcare. Just like we share our uh, driving data, we'll start to become data donors across the paradigm. We can opt in to join clinical trials in much more seamless ways, platforms like Quantified Citizen or Stuff That Works, gleaning insights from thousands or even millions of patients and bringing that to the point of care. And the point of care, of course, is becoming blended, not virtual or physical, but intermittent or, or, or but combined taking us from this era of intermittent reactive sick care uh, to a future that's going to be, as we've kind of already covered, to be much more continuous, proactive, anytime, anywhere. I think that's sort of the big picture of where we're taking us, again, from hospital to hospital and with all the elements in virtual care that we've already talked about amount of time. So I'll just make the point that Virtual care in the future will be quite different. The avatars are getting very, very advanced. It will be entering the mediverse, not the metaverse. Uh, you can turn yourself into an avatar for a couple dollars today very easily, and soon those will, will be animated and powered up uh, to represent you. Um, that begs the question, who do we choose for medical school? How do we teach good website manner, not just good uh, bedside manner going forward? And how do we take all these new forms of data, which are often siloed and not interconnected, and not, not just go from to big data, but to insights and knowledge and translate that more quickly uh, to the point of care, whether that's the bedside, website, or beyond. So in summary, we're entering, the, I think, this is a very exciting health age. Uh, everything is accelerating. It's not about any one technology. It's how we mash them up together to create this new enabled, digital, uh, personalized, smart age of health and medicine. So let's be like Wayne Gretzky. Let's skate to where the puck is going to be, not where the puck has been. Uh, let's create that future and get from now to next more quickly, collaboratively, um, and not take incremental steps, but exponential ones. So with that, thanks for having me, Stefano, and let's go create the future. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, an amazing run through. And if you were to pick one technology that, that's not ChatGPT that's really getting excited in the world of healthcare, which would it be? Uh, I think it was like eight years ago, we had the CEO of Moderna at uh, Exponential Medicine. And no one had heard of mRNA at that time as a potential therapeutic. And of course, we've all learned about it and been using it. I think that's on the cusp of changing almost everything. And that was synthetic biology, vaccines, not just for COVID, but for neurology disease, uh, cancers, and um, the ability to kind of create N of one type therapeutics is gonna get very exciting. N of one therapeutics, great thought to leave us on. Thank you, Daniel. Thanks. Congratulations. <laughs> and for those of you who have a company that are interested in getting on uh, digital.health, uh, Priyank, do you wanna stand up for a second, show everybody, say hi. Go say hi to her, because she will, she will put you on the platform. Um, it's a really great place to be. Uh, so we start out uh, this segment, uh, which precedes our, 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 our shark tank, our bone tank, uh, with an overview of all the incredible technology that's coming around. And uh, I am very honored to be able to introduce to you uh, Nancy. Uh, Nancy um, has been on our, Nancy Lynch, MD, MBA, has been on our board for years now. She runs the Doc SF Venture segment in San Francisco just before JPM. It was, it's our footprint at JPM that we left behind. And every year, she has done an amazing job collecting the data to tell us where the investments are going in this space as well. So we start out with the big picture. Let's hear where smart money is taking uh, investments. Dr. Nancy Lynch. It's right here. I'll, I'll give you a hand. Yeah. And number two is the one we're fine. Yeah. On? Yes? OK, I think I hear myself. I'm Nancy Lynch. Stefano, thank you very much for the invitation to speak here. Um, we have, for the past two years in January, on the eve of JP Morgan, done Doc SF Venture, where we dive deep into the venture investments that are taking place in the musculoskeletal health space, particularly digital health. Um, Stefano this year asked me to give you a summary of what we discussed at that event, and then add a little bit of information on Silicon Valley Bank and the current marketing, market environment or for investing. So I break this up into two bits. The first is a very abbreviated view or a review of the data that I presented in January. And then the second part will go into 
the current market environment for startup financing. Since 2018, $9.86 or $9.6 billion in equity-based capital has been invested into the MSK space. This includes both digital health uh, or digital technologies as well as the non-digital uh, things such as conventional devices and biologics. Um, 2021 was a pretty big year for um, both of those categories with three point. $4 billion going into the space. 2022 followed, it was certainly less investment going in, in um, to, this, to the entire MSK space for 2022, but interestingly, the same proportion, um, let me get, say this, that $3.4 billion represents about 8% of all the venture investments going into devices and digital technologies. So about 8% and in 2022 it was about 7%, so even though it was quite a bit less money. And a total of $6 billion of that 9.6 is all digital health. I think it's important to point out for 2021 in particular, there were several mega deals, those deals that are over $100 million that tend to skew up the view of how much money has been going into the space. I pointed out in particular Hinge Health had two mega deals in one year, which really impacted um, the total amount of funding that went into MSK that year. So I suppose you wonder, all right, we're here talking about digital MSK, and we know that $6 billion went into digital MSK investments in that five years. What technologies were getting funded? Well. I like to categorize um, these investments in a particular way. First of all, we've got the orthofacilitative ancillary technologies that were um, funded. That, that, that comprised more than 50% of the investments in the space over the five years. What are some examples of that? AI-based imaging, pain management using virtual reality, and um, some rehabilitation technologies. 20% of it was direct ortho, and what I mean by that is the technologies that orthopedic surgeons use in the operating room or perhaps in taking care of their patients in the office. Another way to look at this is what is sort of the core technology that's um, the basis of the funding? The, um, when you look at just the core technology, and I have to admit to you it's kind of hard when you look at each of the technologies and each of the products, many of them have multiple technologies built into to what they're doing. But when you look at the core, most important technology, 75% of the investments in this space were AI-based. Now, about 25% of them were technologies that were relevant to physicians in the operating room, so the OR suite. That's a very quick look at the venture investments that were going into the MSK space over the last five years. When we got the panel together, a venture capital panel together, at the complete, I, I reviewed all that data and a lot more at the event in January. When we got the panel together, we had them respond to that data, but then we asked them to discuss what is going on in the current market environment for um, venture investing. I was putting these slides together, the, and I'm gonna review that with you. I was putting these slides together the other, the other day and I realized, well, Sunday, January 8th, can I go back? Uh, it's okay. Um, so Sunday, January 8th was exactly two months prior to the death spiral that became Silicon Valley Bank. On that Wednesday, March 8th, very few people in this room knew what was going on. The following day, we became quite aware, and by Friday morning, it was in receivership. So it's a different environment. But Stefano asked me the question, what is the impact of Silicon Valley Bank's collapse on startup finan uh, financing? And I had to take a step back from that saying, maybe, you know, maybe it doesn't have an impact. Does, so I asked the question of myself, does the SVB collapse impact startup financing or funding at all? So I'm sure that you have read an awful lot about Silicon Valley Bank's collapse. I have read a ton, devoured a bunch of articles. You know, there are a lot of idiosyncrasies in Silicon Valley Bank's business model. Um, they have niche clientele. They failed to, a key thing here, they failed to hedge the interest rate risk associated with their bond and other long-term debt portfolio. 
Um, last week, I don't know if any of you caught this, but the Fed came out and the Federal Reserve came out with their uh, report on the collapse and said this in black and white, they said this is a textbook case of mismanagement by the bank. That's a pretty extraordinary statement. So I'm, I'm, I'm not in any way trying to say that the Silicon Valley bank collapse isn't an important thing. It, it is, it was, it was very acute and was painful for a certain period of time. But I'm going to argue that it's going to be trivial relative to everything else that's going on in the market right now. In fact, that was going on last year. Venture lending, along with venture capital investments, were already receding in the second half of 2022. Let me show you what I mean in one graph on all of the venture debt um, that has been um, allocated over the last 10 years. So the, the dark blue bars are all of venture debt, and then the light blue bars are healthcare venture debt, uh, uh, specifically, or a subset of it. I have overlapped the interest rate. Um, so you can see, the first of all, the inverse relationship. It should be obvious to everybody, but the inverse relationship of interest rates and the impact that that has on any sort of lending. But it, the in the inter as the interest rates rose in 2022, venture lending almost came to a halt. You look at this and you say, but Nancy, 2022 looks like an enormous amount of venture debt. You're right, most of it happened in the first, first half of, of 2022, and then it really um, is down to a trickle. So if not SVB, then what is impacting startup financing right now? Well, our venture panel, one of the venture, pan uh, venture capitalists, said to us, it's, it's, it's like a tale of two worlds right now. A few years ago, we were in the Cambrian explosion period, and right now we're, we are in natural selection. But what did he mean by that? So for the environment, pre-2022, in that Cambrian period that he described, it was near zero interest rate policy. You guys have, li you've lived this, you know all of this, you, you lived through the trillions in stimulus package spending that, that um, took place a few years ago, and you also lived through the booming stock market that was fueling IPOs. So the venture capitalists, they were looking at this environment, they saw a hot health tech market, they wanted in on those deals because they saw a lot of liquidity. So they were investing in all of this health tech that was accelerated by the pandemic, Many of these companies had unproven business models, and they were paying up, these venture capitalists were paying up with out of proportion valuations. A couple of charts here to, to demonstrate what I'm saying. Venture capital has raised a lot of money over the last uh, 10, 10, seven to 10 years. If you look back much earlier, um, around 2010, at a real low point in the amount of healthcare venture um, money that has been raised, this was about two to three years after the financial crisis, and I want you to keep that in mind, because you're going to see this again in about three or four more slides. So Venture raised a bunch of money. They kept going and going and going, and then here it got to um, 2021. 2021 was 14x what was, was raised by venture capitalists in 2010. The venture capitalists put it to work all through 2021, up and to the right in healthcare, money was going in from venture capitalists into all of these companies, particularly health tech. And of course, there was a wide open IPO market. Over 1,000 IPOs were done in 2021. It's just unfathomable to me. I'd, I'd say it's off the chart, but I mean, it's, it's on the chart, so. Um, but it, it, the IPO market was wide open and venture capitalists were taking advantage of that. They were investing and hoping to get a quick flip. But then something changed. The majority of that was this inflation rate, that, uh, this inflation that we've been dealing with, which we were told was transitory, but not so. What happened then is we had a tightening of private capital availability and the cost of capital also went um, much higher. We've had looming recessionary forces for over a year now, and we're not through it. And we also have market volatility, which is causing a, the IPO window to close. How does the venture capital um, uh, industry respond to this? Well, they're showing up all their portfolio companies, making sure that they have reserves to take care of their companies. They're doing extensions on prior rounds. This is probably nuance that most of you guys don't want to know about. But 
they're trying to do everything for their own portfolio companies to avoid down rounds. They're also doing, they're being much more selective about new investments into companies. There's a longer due diligence process and um, there's much more focus on the business model. So um, there's also a lot less money being put into current rounds and um, there are the inevitable down rounds associated with that. So what does that look like graphically? 2022 and 2023, remember that IPO chart that I just showed you? This is the same slide, just adding those two years. Less than 200 IPOs in 2022. I'm breaking that out, that same IPO information out by quarter, and you can see the difference there. Um, just you see the, the downward slide for the IPOs per quarter. I showed you this a little bit ago. This is the venture capital, um, healthcare venture capital fundraising slide. I had you pay attention to the lower end of the, uh, the, the left-hand side of the, of the graph. You see in 2022, venture capital, healthcare venture capital still raised a lot of money, less than the year prior. But this is a lagging indicator. So what happened in 2010 is a result of things, forces that were put in place in 2007 and 2008. We're going to see the same thing happen, for, in my opinion. We're going to see the same thing happen with the venture capital fundraising over the next two to three years. Venture capital also stopped putting money in. Sure, they did put money in, but the, the amount of investments that were going in 2022 really um, dropped. So I wish I had some great message, some really optimistic message for startups, but I don't. There are significant headwinds ahead of you. This is being driven by a prolonged period of uncertainty. We don't know when that's going to end. We're, we just experienced another rate hike today. We don't know when inflation is going to be under control. We don't know. We know a recession is coming. We don't know what the length or severity of it's going to be. We're looking at a fragile regional bank system right now. And um, we're also seeing continued volatility in the public markets. And there are other global and political issues that we're dealing with, too. I would say this. The people who are going to benefit from the current economic environment are the venture capitalists. And I don't mean to be cynical here, but this is where they make their money. <laughs> they, you buy low, sell high. They are looking in the new investments that they're doing. They're looking for great opportunities to put money to work in companies at low valuations so that ultimately they can make a return on their investment. And they're also going to have some associated draconian terms with this. But I'm going to tell you this. So this is the natural um, selection period that we're going through for startups. There are going to be some startups who don't make it. Um, but I'm going to predict. Um, I hope this isn't being recorded, but I'm going to predict that um, we're going to see the same thing with venture capital. There's going to be a period of time where there's going to be some cons consolidation and collapse of venture capital, and it's going to, unfortunately, it's going to be, um, in my, the way I'm looking at it, there are going to be some large firms who become larger. They're going to be able to attract all of the capital but then they're gonna be smaller firms who aren't gonna make it either. So that may be three, four years down the line, but that's how I see it. I wish I had a best, better message for you all right now for the startups, but um, this is the current state of the market. Thank you. Thank you. So um, one question for you is that, but at the same time, there's still a lot of money out there yeah. looking to be put to work. Two, yeah, two things. There, um, the venture capitalists are either, they're either shoring it all up for the reserves for their current portfolio companies, or it's possible LPs will actually take that money back. So, but you're right, there's a lot of money there. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's all gonna be put to work. Yeah. Hey, yeah. thank you so yeah. much. Everybody give it up for Nancy. So Nancy, I forgot to mention, is a founder and principal of Advise Orthopedics Inc., a consultancy focused exclusively on innovation and muscular health. And she's uniquely positioned as an orthopedic surgeon and a venture capitalist to, to, to help in that space. So Innovate Ortho and, and Nancy Lynch. Thank you very much. So we saw the breadth of technology, uh, sort of breathtaking breadth of technology as, as showed us by Daniel. And then Dr. Lynch showed us the, uh, the, the challenges, and we, wanna, uh, we, wanna, we don't want to um, we, we want to produce a halcyon version of reality. We actually did want to bring up those issues and say it's, it's not necessarily all positive in the world of, of the market share. And to really bring that home and to close the loop on that conversation, I've, uh, I've asked Unity Stokes to join me. And now Unity is amazing. He's a co-founder of Startup Health. 
uh, and invest in a global army of entrepreneurs. Uh, his group is called, uh, it's called the Health Transformers. And uh, they've embarked on an extraordinary crusade several years ago to achieve health moonshots, each of which can provide, can improve the lives of at least a billion people. This is where we were 10 years ago. So uh, welcome, welcome Unity. Uh, thank you very much. Welcome to, your, to the stage. Welcome him. Thank you. We're going to have a... <clears throat> So I'm excited to have a little conversation, change it up a little bit from presentations, and we thought we would uh, discuss a little bit about where we Testing. are as a person who's right there on the front lines with these uh, amazing companies. Now, you've invested in over 1,000 companies, 27 countries over the last decade. You've had about four of these cycles go through, and the, and the first one's coming around. So let's talk a little bit about what you're seeing in that space, um, because you, we've had a conversation about that maybe we some of these moonshots we thought we'd handle a decade ago, maybe they didn't happen. So what's the story with that? Well, it was, first of all, it's great to be here. Oh, yeah. And, um, I, you know, over, I've been really reflecting deeply. Um, we started Startup Pulp 12 years ago, and I started in, in health, healthcare about 18 years ago. Um, and a lot of the impact we've been trying to make has actually gotten worse since we started. So, so sobering thought. Yeah, we, we, we set out to achieve these grand health moonshots 12 years ago. And if you look at longevity, life expectancy, obesity, diabetes, mental health, <laughs> suicide, access, cost, it's pretty much gone down or gotten worse. Um, However, um, some really important things have happened in the past 12 years. Um, the first presenter talked about the structural change. So what's really happened is the roads have been built, the foundations have been built, ecosystems have been built, the investors. When we started Startup Health, there were no investors. There were no startups. There were no doctorpreneurs or, and I say no, but very few. Um, there certainly wasn't $44 billion a year going into health innovation investing globally. Um, you know, there was less than a billion. So during that time, let's call that phase one, um, the capital started coming, the innovators started coming, the, the change was happening, changing business models, um, the experiments, um, the demand, meaning customers were circling around the hoop, um, a golden age of entrepreneurship, people starting new things, starting and failing sometimes, but starting. Um, a global um, opportunity started to emerge, so not just here in Silicon Valley, but uh, there's probably 40 or 50 health innovation hubs around the world now, at least, doing really extraordinary things. You go to Finland, mobile health, Israel, uh, med tech, all sorts of interesting things. India, uh, consumer health, new business models. Um, we're, we're now here in, in a new wave, the uh, Cerebral Valley, you know, past six months, um, right here in, you know, our backyard. Um, so while impact appears to have gone down, sometimes you need to take two steps back to seemingly go one step forward, but let's, maybe we're close to going 100 steps forward because um, the, the venture presentation before, so much interesting data there, but the venture model works on a 10-year cycle. Moonshots take 25 years or longer, right? SpaceX, 20, 25 years to do what they're doing now. Um, the types of innovation you're seeing now has happened over two or three decades, but the venture model is structured around a 10-year cycle. So we're, I think, entering a new really exciting phase of opportunity, even though there's a moment of chaos right now and potentially a mass extinction event for many of those companies that uh, Daniel Kraft presented. But we saw that in, in the 90s, I came out of the internet tech world. Most of those companies are gone, except for a couple, like Amazon. 
but at the same time, they are gone, but they're left behind. It was an evolution, right? They didn't die another, from, the, from the ruins of those companies. New companies are born that led to... Google innovation. came out of 2000, you know, after the crash. Yeah. So um, you've got a thousand companies you've invested in. And as uh, Dr. Lynch was pointing out earlier, a lot of the venture capital groups are keeping their money to reinvest in those companies, see them through this valley of death that we're maybe heading into. Yet there's how many billion dollars have invested? It's a tens of billions of dollars invested. When are we going to see some of that technology come to maturity? It should be about now, right? Like we saw with Jared starting to use it in his practice and many of the ones that, that Daniel showed, some of the futuristic, but some have been around for some time. When do you think we'll see the real impact of these technologies? That's what I'm most excited about right now. I, I, I was at two conferences recently. Let's call them health innovation conferences. And I had a distinct feeling that I haven't had since the mid-90s. Um, and in the mid-90s, I was doing this new thing called the World Wide Web you know, internet. Um, and I would go to these conferences and they were interactive CD-ROM conferences, <laughs> right? They were talking about interactive CD-ROMs. And meanwhile, I'm going back and I'm working with Quincy Jones on streaming radio, bringing from Africa, radio stations, um, CD now, first e-commerce, uh, first banner ads, these types of things. And there's these interact, so, a couple months ago, I'm at these conferences and I had the same feeling. I haven't had that feeling before. Where in one room, I feel like we're talking about interactive CD-ROMs. But over in another room, we're talking about the internet. And it's really, really exciting because what's, what, we're, what we're starting to see, and I know we've talked a lot about AI already, but We've been talking about AI for a decade. The difference is people are seeing it. My mom is using ChatGPT. She can feel it, she can touch it, she can do things with it. So we're entering a moment where more people are going to start to feel and touch and experience the innovation and ultimately I think that's where the real magic starts. I think uh, it was one of Mohan Nair's messages this morning, if Mohan is still here, that was uh, really well put, that you ha when you, it becomes real when you touch it, when you feel it, when it touches you personally, and suddenly it becomes something that, oh, I know what I can do with that. And one of the fascinating things that <clears throat> I said this year was that I really want to showcase that these things don't live in a vacuum. They live in an interconnected world. And how they connect is something that we don't know yet. And we're seeing a lot of artists, actually, people who are thinking outside the box, putting several technologies together and coming up with things that the original designers of technology would never have conceived of. So we're definitely in this generative space where this uh, new ability to see and understand that technology is, is really, really move us to a different level. Now, I have a, I have a quick question for you. Um, Everybody here is probably skeptical about Web 3.0 and Metaverse. Um, what, what, how do you see that space evolving? Um, Let me rephrase. Not really thinking about the Metaverse um, or Web 3 other than I think blockchain is significant because of how data gets shared, specifically around IP and the opportunity for drug discovery and sharing IP and some legal structures around smart contracts and all sorts of complicated stuff there. But you, you said something really important about um, imagination. Yeah, sure, let's go back to that. I, I think <clears throat> what's needed now is more imagination because the technology's here. I mean, what we're living in this moment of an innovation paradox in healthcare where Things are, have been moving very, very slow, apparently, or seemingly, but also very fast. I mean, what DeepMind has done, or AlphaFold with, with the, the, the proteins, is going to transform drug discovery. We're, we're going to start to see an already are discoveries and cures that would have been unimaginable in short order, we're starting to see this um, almost on a daily basis now. So very, very quickly, that 
you know, a lot of the exponential innovation, you don't really see how fast it's accelerating until 10, 12, 15 years in. I think that's where we are now. Yeah, as humans, we tend to look at our past history as a way to judge progress. And when, when it's moving exponentially, it's super hard to judge where it's going, right? So um, last question for you then. What are you most excited about in terms of the technology you're seeing uh, people present to you for investment in the healthcare space? Is there a group of technologies that, I mean, it could be chat, GPT, empowered uh, AI, but is there something else that you think we should be paying attention to? Um, in a tactical level, I'm, I'm really interested in the, the brain computer interface opportunity. Um, I'm really interested in food, food as medicine. Um, as it relates to many of the people in this room, I think there's some extraordinary stuff going on with mobility. We've been talking a lot about this. The concept of motion is life. You keep moving, you, you're living. So for any of these big moonshots that we have around longevity, for example, you need to be thinking about the MSK innovation, right? And motion and mobility. Um, I would say I'm most excited about the global opportunity. Um, I think for, for the past 100 years, we've been thinking about a very small window into the opportunity. And, and really what's happened, and I'll be very brief, but the biggest challenge we have today is not actually an innovation or technology or, or money, venture capital, or, or getting some investment. It's actually... Um, it's causing us at Startup Health to rethink everything that we're doing. Because basically there's, imagine a football field. And on one side of the field, there's a game being played called football. And they're dressed up in football uniforms and they're playing these rules called football. And on the other side, they're dressed up as, with tanks and bazookas and playing warfare and it's totally different set of rules and it's a different game being played. And basically, that's what's going on in healthcare. So the innovators are over here, industry's over here. So all that innovation you saw in Dr. Kraft's presentation, those hundreds of awesome innovation, it gets into the real world of healthcare and it stops. Different language, different forms, different structures, it's just dying. Doesn't matter how much capital they're raised, the billions of dollars that SoftBank puts in or whatever, we've seen all these things just get wiped out, the pair therapeutics and whatever. Great innovation, but then it gets to the real world of commercialization and it's dying. So what's needed are new frameworks speaking the same language on both sides, teaching everyone the same set of rules, entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs, and so the innovation pipeline goes from here to there all the way to impact so that we can start to see better outcomes and impact. That's what's needed now. I want to pick up on a bunch of things you said because there's so many things in there. I'm going to go backwards. Tomorrow, we will have a lecture on integration layers because we've seen all these point solutions, and for many people, it's hard to understand how they could possibly access them all. Integration layers between you and DMR will probably be the way that will handle it. Uh, you talked about brain-computer interfaces. I think for most people, it's still science fiction. Let me assure you, it is no longer science fiction. The debate today is not whether or not we can read your mind. Is how many, uh, how difficult will it be to write to your mind and erase memories. And that is currently no longer science fiction and something that's definitely happening and to the point that we're talking about brain rights. Do you have, what rights do you have to your thoughts and how are we gonna control that? Um, you also talked about food and food is science. And for those of you who are being following this, this is no longer Berkeley stuff where you take some mushrooms and some vegetables and you feel better. This is about how do you completely re-envision re your gut biome and, manage, and use that to manage your depression and other issues. It is very much coming to the forefront of um, health. Um, food is health, but it's no longer just a marketing term. So amazing conversation. I think we have 40 seconds left. Is there anything... Um, you, this bit about the interface and, and you know where healthcare goes to die, that the, these startups don't have the tanks to go fight the battle on the battlefield. Um, how are we going to get out of that problem? Um, well, our plan is we're creating a university. Um, I mentioned uh, uh, Dr. Nair mentioned at the at the beginning 
one of his mentors created a university, we're creating a university called Health Transforming University to educate the, not just the entrepreneurs, which we've been focused on, but the entrepreneurs as well, so that we can create common language and see more innovation make its way through the pipe. So education is the key. Great. Well, great, congratulations and good luck with the university. Ladies and gentlemen, Unity folks, thank you so thank much. You. <clears throat> well, take this with me. Um, we're now gonna go to a quick break. Um, I think we may even be a little bit over. I apologize for that, um, but that was a really wonderful conversation. Uh, when we come back from the break, we're gonna start our first bone tank, um, which is our version of a shark tank. I wanna have a, a, a few, uh, a total of six uh, startups being presented. Uh, we'll give you more information about that when we come back. And it is now 15 past, so maybe 15 minutes, so you pick at 4.30. All right, everybody, if we could sort of start wandering back in. It's, uh, it was really fun, I just had, uh, we have two of our residents here, and they, I love young guys are very thoughtful and smart and they're ready to start to synthesize all the ideas they heard. So listen, that clicker that didn't work at the beginning, maybe we can do a little innovation hub about how to do a mind-bending, mind-connected clicker and move on to the next step, which is exactly the way we'd like everybody to think as they leave here, get that innovation mindset going uh, and start thinking a little bit about pro problems that you see on an everyday basis. Um, so we're gonna do something, so let's just recap the morning we talked about Innovation writ large, having innovation mindset, looking at design thinking, looking for problems in the world around you you can solve, at the importance of innovating around them. Um, we saw uh, how some of these technologies can be applied in practice. We took a small break. We came back and looked at the whole venture capital space. Uh, we saw the great technologies that are being applied from, from a thousand uh, foot view. We talked a little bit about the um, uh, the, the markets and a, a, very, a very clear view, a very unobstructed view of where money is right now. We uh, had an opportunity to speak to, uh, with Unity, who's, had, who's been an investor for the last decade in the space and where they're going. Um, and now we're gonna do uh, a shark tank. We called it a bone tank, it was a sort of a twist, but almost nobody understood that, so it's a bit of bad marketing on our part. Um, uh, and we partnered with Health Hub and I have the opportunity to ask Mark Goldstein to step up a little bit and introduce that concept. Mark is a venture capitalist. He has been a venture capitalist for since college, I think almost right off the bat. He's been very successful in that space. And then a few years ago, having been involved with University of California, San Francisco, decided to see if it was a way for him to help connect the brilliant minds in our labs at the university with some of the um, innovators that were trying to innovate in similar spaces but may not have had the clinical background, Innovative Health Hub. So he is the president and CEO of the Health Hub Foundation and the Digital Health Awards, and he's partnered with us this year to support this, uh, this project. So Mark, come on up to stage and tell us a little bit about what you've been doing. Microphone four. It should be on, uh, microphone four. Hello. Okay. There you go. Pleasure to be at Doc SF. First of all, um, hats off to Stefano. This, uh, this event worldwide is the event for innovation in MSK and more. And uh, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. So um, what we've done this, this year for the first time, what's called the uh, Digital Health Hub Foundation, we run what's now the uh, world's largest healthcare award show. And we do it at the HLTH conference in Las Vegas. Um, we started here in San Francisco. Um, we had Chase Center two years ago. We're now at, in Vegas. Seems like all the teams, we all uh, seem to be moving to Vegas lately. Um, but um, last year we had uh, 1,500 companies, 1,000 judges, uh, 3,000 people in the audience. Really big event. This year it's going to be even bigger. Um, we have 13 award categories, and it's gone great. But after five years, we said, let's shake it up a little bit. And we thought one of the most important categories that we were not honoring was um, surgical innovation, and in, specifically in MSK, and all the work that Doc SF is doing. We also added a, a, an award for longevity and one for health equity, but we added an award for this here, because we said this is damn important. And uh, we want the world to understand um, how it's so critical that, base, that uh, physicians and take this new technology that's coming out and so that we can cure what's coming in an increasingly older world. You heard amazing 
uh, uh, words from uh, Daniel Kraft, who's one of our executive producers. But without technology, um, you know, the surgical suite is not changing. So we want to basically promote the poop out of it, and we're going to. So what's going on today is you have, you're going to see three or four companies that uh, Blake is going to, Blaine, Blaine is going to introduce. And all of these companies are automatic quarterfinalists in our, um, our big contest. We expect 100 or so companies to, uh, to become, to apply for this category. And uh, these are some great ones. And it's an absolute pleasure to be a part of DocSF and um, to make everyone in the world know the importance of what's going on in surgical innovation and innovation and what you guys are doing. So I'm just, get, I, get, I get an easy, it's pretty easy for me. I just, he said, just come up here, dance, and get the hell off of stage. So um, you just got to do what Stefano tells you to do, and you know, then, you, then things end well. You don't do what he tells to do. You know, he's, op he's, he's, he's ripped me apart. He's operated me. You know, things don't end well. Just listen to Stefano. Um, so Blaine, Blaine's been doing this for a while. He's um, basically, he's a trained in sports medicine. He uh, started something uh, called uh, Brain Lab. Uh, and took it, took it into orthopedics in 2001, wow. And uh, 19 patents, um, basically in uh, surgical navigation. He is the, the guy to lead this phone take, really ask the right questions, bring up, uh, he's gonna bring up a bunch of other panelists. Um, he's had seven successful exits over the last 15 years, so he knows a little bit about entrepreneurship. So I think uh, here's the inaugural bone, bone tank, and here is the uh, bone tank man, Blaine. The reviewers up here, if you, if you wouldn't mind taking a seat, I'll be sitting with you. We're going to have uh, three companies in the first set, and then there are three companies in the second set. You know, the, the goal here is really uh, to, to understand, like, is this... Are these companies uh, finding a good product market fit? And so be thinking to yourself, like, how would you utilize this application or these companies? And what do you see for their futures? And um, hopefully we get a, a question or two from each of the uh, panelists uh, for each of the companies. I think we're going to start with, who do we have first? Uh, Deep Structure. Yeah, OK, I'm sorry. Yeah, um, I was supposed to do a quick introduction, but I, ultimately, I think Everyone should look up uh, these, these esteemed uh, colleagues here. Uh, we have Sid from Stryker. We have Stuart Simpson, who used to be the CEO of Stryker, now with Think Surgical, Thorpe Davis with Ortho Virginia, and Peter Schilling from uh, Dartmouth and Hitchcock. Um, please look up their, uh, their backgrounds. It's really impressive group of people here. Um, time to go. We have five minutes uh, for each company, and then we're going to do a question and answer at the bot at the end. It's about 15 minutes, uh, basically about a one-minute question for each. So um, keep your questions pretty tight, and uh, let's get on with this. Let's have some fun. Uh, startups are the way to go. This is an exciting time for uh, startups, and uh, you'll notice a lot of common themes here. But um, I, I, the idea is hopefully to, that we pick. Uh, uh, for yourselves where you think this future is going to go. Fantastic. Hi, I'm Derek Amanatula. I'm an assistant professor of orthopedic surgery at Stanford and co-founder of Insight Surgical. Insight Surgical is an artificial intelligence platform that utilizes computer vision to objectively document healthcare information. Today, healthcare costs $4.3 trillion, and inside all of that cost exists a $505 billion blue ocean data opportunity. That to basically reduce the cost and waste of healthcare. We currently use subjective verbal data, basically like the operative notes I write every single day, to define the value of healthcare. What we believe at Insight Surgical is that an objective video data pipeline will finally allow healthcare to increase safety, reduce cost and cost variability, and improve outcomes. Insight Surgical, I said, is an artificial intelligence platform. We can retrofit an operating room in a weekend. We take up absolutely no floor space, and we allow a software, by service, software as service pricing framework. At the end of the day, what we do is we take cameras and extract objective data, apply machine learning and computer vision models to that, and extract information from this space. The things we can do is track the proximity of people to the sterile field, the room traffic that we know is correlated with infection. 
We can track objects as small as needles or as deformable as laparotomy sponges, which turn out to be the most dangerous objects in surgery. But perhaps the most valuable thing we do is we can actually time the phases of the room and feed information that you would normally pass on verbally to your staff to increase the performance of your team. We can digitize the surgical count, we can keep track of trays, and we can keep track of the inventory in a case calculating the exact cost of a surgical case. We can also assemble dashboards, utilizing Bosk and Whisker plots here shown for operative times to allow administrators to drill down on outlier cases and figure out what outcomes are associated with those cases and what led to those things without observing, without having high at level consultants to perform this task and without overburdening nursing to collect the information. It turns out that surgery centers need to constantly reevaluate their bottom line. And because they're reevaluating their bottom line, this is a great time for us to capitalize on just the low hanging fruit. If we look at reducing inventory waste or personnel inefficiency by just 10%, we can deliver a net savings to an ambulatory surgery center of over $350,000 per OR. If we look at the market landscape, it's really broken down into two large groups. Medical record conglomerates, which basically use old subjective data and actually I don't think can innovate healthcare any longer. And computer vision players that take in objective data, but unfortunately have focused on me, the surgeon. We believe we need to use objective data in order to empower the entire surgical team to improve efficiency as well as safety and outcomes for our patients. Numerous leaders across many prominent institutions, Cleveland Clinic, Hospital for Special Surgery, Kaiser Permanente, and, Sa and Stanford, believe that this is the fundamental new way to manage surgical operations. This is our deployed system in Tulsa, Oklahoma, the first functional operating room of the future. Uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma, was, and, and the Oklahoma Surgical Hospital was so impressed with our system that they're now expanding from two functional systems to 20 in July of this year. Ambulatory surgery centers are now saying yes to end-site surgical and we're working with Spine and Sports Surgery Center here in Campbell, California on product market fit. And we already have a, a 55 OR distribution deal with a large medical device manufacturer under NDA, ready to run and with over $2 million of ARR to be supplied to end-site surgical. Based on that traction, and, our, and, and just gradual revenue growth, we expect in 2023 to have an exit ARR over $25 million with 29 functional systems installed by the end of the year. I will tell you as a surgeon, I am humbled by how hard this task is and what type of multidisciplinary team we needed to assemble to accomplish this. And so on behalf of that team, I wanna say thank you for giving me the opportunity to present Insight Surgical and the future of surgery to you today. Terrific. Next we'll have uh, next. deep structure. Thank you. My name is Dr. Jared Weir. I'm an orthopedic surgeon in Saginaw, Michigan, and I'm the chief medical officer and founder for Deep Structure. Deep Structure is a seed stage digital orthopedic company and we specialize in a software suite that helps change the delivery of care in orthopedics. We were founded in 2019, and we developed our first prototype um, in 2021, became FDA registered uh, in 2022, and our MVP has been finalized and went live in clinic at the end of last year. There's a four-man team of us, uh, all in the orthopedic healthcare um, space. And the problem we're trying to solve is one that's facing practices like mine uh, across the country. It's the headwinds that have formed in uh, the modern day of orthopedics. These are things like falling reimbursement rates, staffing crisis, patient expectations that continually uh, change, and physician dissatisfaction. So our platform is five technologies in one transformative uh, experience. I joined my father's practice in 1986, and up until two years ago, we practiced the same way that he did. Nothing had changed. Despite that, 40 years of technologic improvement happened, and we just, as a, as a medical and orthopedic community, seemed to ignore it. 
And so we've layered in and brought in these technologies into this platform, and it starts with a mobile patient experience. This is a, a, an app we call Eunice, and she interacts with the patient. I don't have a big staff, so Eunice helps collect all the patient data and helps interact with patients, and is really an extension of me. In addition to that mobile app, we layer on a, a remote patient monitoring. It's a hardware-less monitoring uh, system where we're able to uh, measure the knee range of motion using the IMUs in everybody's cell phones. And so we have 80-year-old knee replacement patients that are using their cell phones to measure their knees. This is helpful because there are some software or hardware solutions on the market and that's not universally uh, adoptable for everyone, but everybody uh, almost exclusively has a cell phone these days, even the people in the geriatric population. That stuff's great. Uh, that's what the prototype had, but um, it's not enough, to be honest. Doctors are very uh, eager to move on to the next thing, and if you give them a dashboard to look at, it quickly becomes ignored. A third screen's impossible. So Smart X-Ray is the third pillar of our MVP that went live. And what we do is we take all of that data that Eunice collects, all the remote patient monitoring, and we synthesize it down and just summarize it in the very most important pieces. And then we overlay that on something I'm looking at already, which is the patient X-Ray. And that's where Smart X-Ray comes on. And in addition to that, we can start pulling in the imaging data as well. The last piece is the digital phenotype. The artificial intelligence, which is sometimes referred to as a digital twin in other industries. But what we're able to do is take all of these data points and then create predictive models. And now, before I ever have uh, discussed surgery with a patient, before I ever perform that surgery, I can start predicting what the outcomes will be. And we kind of all talk about that, but this is where it gets a little bit interesting. How do you define successful surgery? And if you've been in AI enough, you know the errors of picking an endpoint that's not actually what you want. There's videos on the internet of AI trying to race boats and the boats catching fire because you didn't actually teach people or teach the AI system what they should strive for. So we've defined surgical success and that's one of our biggest improvements. The last thing is an asynchronous telehealth. You take those four pillars and then you actually deliver it to patients in a way that's um, accessible to them when and where they want it. Where we really have advantages is that we're surgeon founded. We can develop and get to, de we can from de development to deployment is very fast. We can go right to the OR with one version to do a case, we can change the user interface on the next case and try different things. We're the first to market with this complete suite, and we're able to eliminate a work day a week for each surgeon. So with this platform, I can give myself a day. My case study, this is live. So we had a patient that was having troubles, and we were able to intervene on them because they told Eunice and, and get that patient feeling better. Thanks. All right, and last, we have Zuno. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Alan McNichol, CEO of uh, Zuno Medical. Um, make sure I got the right slide up. Okay, great. Um, the OR suite generates, on average, 60% of the revenue for, uh, on, on average for hospitals and 30% of the waste. And I'll come back to why the waste is important. There's a pretty big economic impact there. Um, but the OR suite depends on a tremendous amount of instruments, devices being processed through steam sterilization. And when you look at things like total joints, it can be anywhere from eight to 14 on up of sets that are needed for one single procedure. Um, and those uh, types of procedures obviously have been growing uh, quite considerably and will continue to do so with the aging population. Um, but this antiquated way of sterile barrier detection, you can see there holding a blue wrap up to the light or uh, rigid sterilization containers with polypropylene filters um, severely impacts uh, the OR because they're not found until the patient's already in there and they're trying to open those up. So it often leads to delayed and canceled cases. Um, there's been little to no innovation for decades, four decades in sterile containment systems. Um, 
And again, these are all only found out, it, are they still kept sterile or not, typically when they're opened up in the OR. The Zuno Smart Container is a patented sterilization uh, system. It has an instant sterile barrier, for, be, sterile barrier verification, which I will show you. Um, it received FDA de novo clearance, which was quite an extensive clearance. They were uh, pretty skeptical that uh, electronics could work inside the autoclave and will actually be uh, a big backlog of hospitals and surgery centers that will begin trials, uh, sales trials next month. Um, the problem right now is, again, these, the surprise that'll happen in the OR and a lot of inefficiencies built up that go all the way back to the device vendors uh, through to the OR related to the current uh, uncertainty with the sterile barrier system. So traditional blue wraps, uh, there's uh, one particular study showed that only 56% of the time, if there's a tear or a puncture, are they accurately identified, uh, which is a bit of a scary thought uh, on that. The uh, sterile processing is typically one of the biggest constraints to doing more procedures, whether that be in a hospital or a surgery center. And more complex procedures are moving to those surgery centers, which typically do not have that sterilization capacity. Current containment systems basically create healthcare and efficiencies, as I mentioned, all the way back to the OEM vendors uh, with duplicate sets, with a lot of opportunities for human error, um, additional inventory that's required. Um, also, I, and I've been around the country quite a bit in Chicago, Kansas City, Southern California recently, every single place is having problems with high staff uh, turnover, particularly sterile processing where they're underpaid and under a lot of duress. Uh, because of the importance in the OR, which ends up the retraining of, of some of these uh, uh, really laborious tasks that have a lot of opportunity for human error. Here's the current sterile barrier options. Uh, you've got the blue wrap kind of over on that side and typical uh, rigid sterilization containers that were supposed to solve a lot of those problems, but in some cases they create their own. So the solution to these challenges is a Zuno smart container. Now, what does it mean to be a smart container, and I have it here. We, we leverage a standard autoclave to be able to create a verifiable vacuum seal. We have a control module on here that has digital pressure, temp temperature, and humidity sensors to track and uh, identify what's happening with an autoclave. These valves are electromechanically controlled, and they're open as they go in, so there's no obstruction for sterile flow. You get optimal serum flow in and optimum, optimal moisture extraction out during the drying cycle. Far better than any other solution on the market. When it's done, it closes these valves at just the right time, creating that verifiable vacuum seal. You can see the green check mark there that tells you it's it. So there's, it wipes away the surprises in the OR. In the OR and only in the OR, they vent this and this is really fun. Um, which is, a, it's a very satisfying feeling and that's how, uh, you know, it's then open just next to the sterile field, confidently being able to just uh, put the contents on the tray in there. So we have simple time-saving design. It takes seconds to prep versus minutes for the, for the others. Eliminates the human error. Disposable components, ORs have $10 million a year, hospital, sorry, over $10 million a year in waste. Three million of that is, uh, three billion, sorry, billion, billion. Three billion of that is out of the OR. Um, so it's a huge economic component. We offer them as a service, so there's no maintenance. And as stated, we have a far better means of getting that sterile in, making sure the contents is sterilized and then extracting the moisture out. So we really are one of the key enablers to have a more efficient OR. Thank you. Great. We'll get the companies back up for a Q&A. Uh, this will be a short one. We'll have about a uh, question from each panelist to each company and uh, keep them pretty tight answers, you know? Pretty, pretty short. Thank you. You can stay up here. All of us, yeah, all three. We're, we're gonna just kind of run through it. So uh, I think that the, probably the best choice is to start with deep structure as we started and uh, maybe we'll just ask you a few questions. All yeah. right, super. Great to see you again. This yeah. is number three. Two and four. Okay. Uh, so I love that you're a surgeon-founded business. I, I'm a big fan of solve the problems that you have. So really excellent stuff. The big question um, I have is, is really around your value prop. I think you were 
starting to get into what the value prop is and how that has impacted your practice. I would love to learn more. Yeah, the the proposition is we can uh, we change the way we deliver care so that patients' expectations are met with how they want to receive care, similar to they receive other services. The e economics of that, I think you were going to get into that at the end of your... Yeah, uh, so with the remote patient monitoring, we my office does have an additional revenue stream, plus with the cost savings, I'm saving money as a private practitioner. So <clears throat> from your presentation earlier, I was very impressed about your resource optimization model. I think that's a very smart way of addressing the challenges that you face. Uh, and I can see why you've uh, built what you've built here. Um, the big question, I guess, from an adoption perspective is what information and data goes into the digital phenotype uh, and how much of it do you have in order to build trust with um, other physicians who might want to adopt the technology? Yeah, so there are thousands of data points that go in, and, and I was already over on my time. But uh, yeah, so it's everything from traditional data that you might expect, proms and things like that, to crazier stuff, like people leave audio diaries for Eunice, and we can analyze them for sentiment. And so it is a wide range to create these really deep digital phenotypes, so you can put questions to it that you really want to know. But how many patients worth of data have you accumulated thus far? Yeah, so we went live at the end of last year. So we're in the hundreds of patients, uh, meaning on one, working our way to 200. <laughs> I appreciate the transparency. Yes. I have a more straightforward question, but actually maybe it's not. Is I'd like you to go into more depth about how you define success. Uh, what you're doing is an area that I do kind of more basic research in, and I got to tell you that is the, as you've cited, one of the most frustrating aspects of it. The PROs are, it's a perception of an outcome. It's not an outcome. So what, how are you guys getting around this? Because it is very hard. Yeah, so I think we got it licked, and uh, we'll, we'll get a beer and I'll talk to you. I'll talk to anybody who wants to know. But the, what you're asking is, how do you rectify objective success and subjective success in a way that makes sense? That's what we did. It's a long conversation. <laughs> Hi, I'm, I'm Thorpe Davis. I'm also in private practice, so I have uh, sort of more down-to-earth questions. So in your talk earlier, you said you're in the off, you're in the OR, you do two cases in a room, you, you interact with patients between cases. You still have to see all your new patients face-to-face -face the first time, correct? There's no uh, virtual nature to that. So what you saw in the first talk was Dr. Jared, we are the practice. As chief medical officer, we do things a little different. So um, if you're talking about my, as a private practitioner, uh, no, we can deliver preoperative um, uh, care and what or treatment recommendations. And what happens is patients view it, and then it usually ends with something like, call my, uh, my, my staff will reach out with you and call. And the patient will say, yeah, I'm ready to proceed, or I'd like to come in and meet in person. Um, that stuff is available through the telehealth uh, platform uh, of Deep Structure as our next version, which hopefully we'll get to by next quarter. So you would interact with somebody virtually, and the next time you would see them would be to do surgery? I could, yeah. For some patients, I could. And I had a patient that did something close to that. Think of it pretty simply. If you replace one person's shoulder and they want to come back two years later to talk to you about the other one and they are two years away, or two hours away, excuse me, um, they may just want to get a video visit where you review their x-rays and present that to them. And then they'll sign up for surgery and you, you meet them again for the first time in pre-op. All right, thank you. Uh, next group. Sure. Insight. Okay. Hello. Cool presentation. Thank uh, you. I love, I love computer vision. Um, you mentioned you were going live uh, in sites locally in the Bay Area. And you know, my question is really about as you discover product market fit, what are some of the you know, sets of feedback that, that you're receiving? And how are you as an early stage company responding to that feedback? Is it easy with you know, the way you have your system set up? 
Yeah, so the system, actually, we've taken product market fit in from multiple circulating nurses. They interact with the interface as we digitize it. I think we've done over 100 circulating nurses. We take their feedback in because usability and adoptability are a primary thing. Additionally, we account for their anxieties, basically, because uh, they're going to take computer vision into the operating room. So we blur their faces and name badges a priori, show that to them across our data set. Um, it, finally, product market fit is at the hospital and the administrator level. That's the buyer level. So in our, our, basically, we meet with the hospital executive team and basically sit down and figure out what are the information that we're extracting for them correlates directly with revenue because that's what they want to see. So we're actively doing that right now. And then quick product question, if I may. Um, how do you ensure super accurate counts when it comes to laps or instruments that might get occluded given that your cameras are sort of around the ceiling? There's multiple ways to do that. So with respect to occlusions, it turns out hands are the most common occluding objects, so we account for that. Uh, and when it comes to system performance, realize people counting objects are only accurate 75% of the time. So they're wrong 25% of the time. That's how common a miscount is. Turns out, say with laparotomy sponges, we're accurate over 90% of the time. The, we, the way we do that is we place them in parallel. Humans help the CV system become more accurate, and the CV system identifies when humans miscount. So we get to a 2% accuracy rate, 25 times, say, 10. So at the end of the day, they're summative, and we put them next to each other. That allows us to correct ourselves automatically. Dr. Manitoula, it was a, a fascinating presentation. The technology is super cool. And uh, my question is largely around how do you how do you center, how, how have you made the decisions to focus on what you're focusing on? Because the application of the technology is yeah. broad and quality control in the operating room is the kind of- Number one. Right? Yep. I, I'll tell you the market told us. Okay. So I started this as an object detector, something that would be able to you know, do a stocks and flow problem, keep patients really safe with needles and lap sponges or the most dangerous objects. The easiest way to manage safety for hospitals is to ignore it and to turn it into a risk decision based on money versus risk. So quickly, we pivoted our models to the most valuable thing in the room, the work of the people, and how to present that to people in a nice way where we could assemble higher performing teams and talk about quality without outing poor decisions or without, so how do we create quality? We anonymize people, we get them to talk about procedures and performance in a way that values them, rewards them, incentivizes them, nudges their behavior. This is what every hospital system wants. So in a sense, we created a behavioral change engine by looking at people as opposed to an object detector that we could bolt on later. Which I think is smart, and you'll ultimately build trust yes. in your Number technology. One and then you'll probably start to talk about surgeon behavior inside the, the surgeon operating Surgeon behavior, room. rep behavior. So yeah. the answer is if, if it's not adopted by the people in the room, they don't love it. It doesn't make their work better every single day. They're not going to adopt it. And so at the end of the day, we're very cognizant of the fact that by going to people, we need to make sure that they get value out of the device in the room and on the bottom line. Now, I was mentoring a company that was w working in a earlier stage version of this, and they ended up with a billion dollar exit to um, one of the large med tech companies. So, uh, congratulations. We're working on it. <laughs> uh, love the concept, love the idea. A um, Little bit of a lead up to the question, but I'll frame the question first, which is I wanna know specifically, really granularly, what features do you have right now that are delivering the value? Because this is like an age old problem of you gotta deliver value now to trade for the video, right? There's tons that you can do with that video beyond you know, needle counts, sponge counts, things yeah. like that. But my guess is people aren't buying it right now for a needle and a sponge count, it's the future. So what do you got right now? Right now it's really that we don't need any, so everyone who measures operative time is conflicted. We have a model that's highly accurate at estimating surgical time utilizing a model, and it didn't take that much video to get it. Associating data with that in that dashboard to drill down on who was in the room, what was the cost of that room, what were the items brought into that room, what were the outcomes in the future of those outlier performances is exactly what the hospital knows. That's what they're buying right now. Um, <clears throat> is there any thought about a live feedback. You know, obviously, infection prevention is great. Uh, we don't have 
We have six operating rooms in my private practice just in our city. I think we have 30 total in our practice. We don't have a lot of infections because those patients are going to the hospital. Um, but the fear is leaving something in the patient. Um, but it's not helpful unless you know it before the patient is sewn up. Is there any thought of how to use this to do something that's proactive at the time rather than reviewing it later? Yeah, I'll give you two answers to that. I think initially, because we're gonna place this in synergy with people, we don't know how much we can bug them in that room. Okay, we know that when the nurse bugs us for that particular thing that might not be retained. The answer is we handle it as a stocks and flows problem. Counting 10 lap sponges or 10 needles on the back table actually protects no one, just makes us feel great on a piece of paper. It's a stocks and flows problem and we basically play clue. We look for objects to be lost from our tracker. Those objects are either on the floor, under a drape, or in the patient. When they get lost in the patient, we make sure, we keep those in a folder, we make sure those, those return. That's how we keep them safe. Initially, we'll just watch that, and eventually we'll prompt you when that's there. Um, I think you can do the same thing with respect to almost any other object that enters the patient, so don't think that's restricted to lap sponges or needles. The key here is we might want that as surgeons. The administrator isn't buying that right now. So I think that that is a second system or a third safety system that bolts on in the SaaS software now. If we don't hit revenue fast, nobody's going to buy it. Uh, one last question. What about data access? Because you're, you're obviously training like tons of models and annotating all this data. Um, is that baked into your business model when you deploy your system that you get access to all that data you're collecting? Yeah, so we basically, basically data can, as much data can stay on the hospital side as possible, but we do something other than blurring the faces and name badges, we create a non-discoverable data set. As we break that up into our particular models or into particular annotations, we only save the annotations that make our models more performant. So as you look back, you can't discover anything. But that also gives us a level of anonymity inside of that data on top of the blurring. And lastly, Zuno, uh, we'll keep this pretty short so we sure. can keep moving. Whatever they got. Uh, uh, very, very cool that you did a de novo respect. Th those are hard. Yeah, well, we weren't given a choice, actually. Yeah, to yeah, yeah. That's and they are hard. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So so coming out of the de novo, what are the insights you gained around your platform? And sub part of that, is this platform, you, you talked about electronics going into an autoclave. Like, what else can you do with that? So much. Uh, a lot that I... Uh, can't necessarily talk about because some of it we're still filing some IP for, but we do see this as a platform that initially is solving a key problem of guaranteeing, you know, a sterile barrier is intact when it goes into the OR, but there's a whole bunch of things on that. I mean, just let me, one of my pet peeves is this little chemical indicator that goes into every tray set that gets sterilized that turns at 80 degrees C when it's either 132 or 135 C that has to be hit, and yet the entire industry says, did that change color, and then I'm okay. Um, I see people stacking containers in the autoclave, running them, and because the indicator changes, they think it's okay on that side of it. So some scary stuff kind of going on in that. There's a lot we can do to confirm what happened inside that autoclave chamber. We have kind of determined the, the, that both the FDA and the industry is probably not ready for that yet, but something very, if you imagine we have a digital temperature sensor and a digital pressure sensor in there, very easy for us to actually determine those things. So that's a hint of some of the things to come. So I understand the attraction to the space. Um, there's a, uh, there's something to solve there, and there's a massive total addressable market when you think about the number of trays that yes, there is. Ster steam sterilization every single day yep. in this country and around the world. So yep. I understand it. What's your insight about why previous um, attempts to change this market away from blue wrap have failed? And why, 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 the, why you, why now? Well, so, so first of all, there's a lot of things that have changed related to uh, electronics and sensors that can operate at very high temperature environments that didn't exist before. Um, there, and so I think that's one of the, that, that are actually a lot more economical now than they were previously. I also think uh, at times there's been, you know, potentially people thinking about that and think, oh, we're going to Wi-Fi connect all of these things and do some things that sound great, but actually cost a lot in power budget and other costs 
create adoption barriers for hospitals because you have to go through their IT department and things of that nature. We tried to really look at where's the highest value proposition that we can have and how do we eliminate as many of those adoption barriers. And I think that's a big key as to why the market's ready for us right now. Yeah, as an investor, um, I would be very interested, and I don't need an answer today, in your business model because this technology either succeeds yeah. big or fizzles out based sure. on the right business model. It's a, well, it's a subscription service, so we, uh, there's no way I want the hospitals managing that. And one of the things I did very early on before joining up with the company was really to vet that. And, and I think when they see it, and they know that they don't have to deal with it, actually it's usually a very comforting thing for them. So I, I think it's gonna be a big, and I'm, I come from the software background, so recurring revenue models are very attractive to me. Uh, narrow, but I think important question. I had my OR table uh, torn down, case delayed because of bio burden. And I feel like that is most times for folks that don't know what bio burden is, it's if there's a fleck of maybe bone cement, maybe bone, maybe some unidentified black object that you just don't know what it is and you gotta sure. tear the table down. Does your technology address bio burden at it, all? It, it doesn't at this point, no. I mean, I do think there are some aspects that, that we have in mind when a tray is being packed where we could look at some of those things. It might uh, uh, lean on some of the technologies that other people are talking about within that. But, uh, but at this point, no. And again, I think from a standpoint of uh, proving that electronics can work in an autoclave and that we're identifying bio burden correctly was probably an FDA hurdle I didn't really want to climb first go. So you need to put Insight Surgical inside the autoclave. <laughs> well, I actually do think there's a lot of opportunity between what we're doing kind of within that. But, uh, yeah. I think it's super cool. And if you Thank need you. a beta site, we'll be it for you. Love it. Um, Where are you at? Uh, in, in Virginia. All okay, over Virginia. that's all right. Yeah. I can travel. A um, few questions. Is it AAMI, AAMI approved yet? Uh, is it stackable? Uh, so when I look at those, we have one surgeon sure. who uses 20 trays for a total sure. hip in our outpatient. And our room to store stuff is small. So if you said you're going to give me 30 of those, unless I can stack them, I'm in trouble. So and also only, what breaks on them when they break? So not only are they stackable, but th when they're not in use, the base is nest. And when I show that to people in OR and sterile processing, they go, "Wow!" They just think that's kind of one of the best, one of the coolest things on it. And if you come out to our, our table, I'll ha be happy to show you that. Um, sorry, what was the other question? AAMI approved? Uh, so, I mean, it's actually FDA is the one that you kind of have to get. Amy kind of has some other things. So we're now on a working group with Amy that's defining transport protocols. But, and one of the important things for us to be there is we got that de novo. We, there's a new classification of sterilization container called sterilization container with uh, with electronic monitoring, right? And we're the only game in town in that. We have a utility patent that will keep us to be the only game in town. And we need to be there for, so Amy actually understands there's a different approach for this. It does has no porous barriers. They can be transported much more easily. And in fact, our first paying customer is one of the OEM vendors that is uh, looking at offsite sterilization and delivering these into ASCs kind of through that. So we think there's a huge opportunity for us in that. Uh, we are working with Amy uh, on that. And again, it's, you know, we got to use the chemical indicators and the other protocols. Sorry, I know we got to go. So. Terrific. Right. Wow. 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 Great startups. Our second group. Yep. Yep. Okay. One more question. All right, we're gonna have the extra group. This is a neat group because they're all similar in nature. So I think ultimately you'll be able to piece out what part of this puzzle is most interesting. And uh, you know, digital orthopedics is about the patient. So this is where we're gonna go. Uh, we have three more companies coming up and four panelists. I, and we, and I'd like to introduce everybody. We have uh, Corey Callendine. Wow. Oh, he didn't. He, didn't, he left. Okay. Uh, uh, Nadar. Good to see you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, Tobias, we had a nice conversation a few minutes ago all the way from Berlin. This is amazing. And Mark, again, for uh, obviously has plenty of experience here. Uh, first company? I'm doing this first time. I'm going to uh, change the format, so blame me. But rather than having each company come up, present, and you each give a question to each company, which will take another hour, you each get a question of any company. Now you pick the company. If it's all, if they all go to stable, they all go to stable. If they all, it just depends on how good their presentations are. Okay, perfect. Right. One question, and then if we can take from there. Thank you. Here's Stable. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Stable, 
and we are a digital health platform moving post-op recovery from a clinic to a patient's living room. By end of day today, statistically speaking, there are going to be nearly 20,000 orthopedic surgeries performed in the nation, contributing to the 7 million for the year. And a lot of those patients are going to get home and be left with just one thing, a single sheet of paper showing them the recovery protocol that they need to follow from home to recover from their surgery and stay on track with what needs to be done. However, as of right now, only 30% of these protocols are being completed by the patients, exposing them to significant adverse health effects like chronic conditions, limited and suboptimal outcomes coming out of surgery, and at worst case, the need for revision surgery. So to better, and collectively, these healthcare costs are costing health, health systems $36 billion every single year. So to better help patients recover from surgery wherever they may be, but still stay connected with their clinical staff at the operating hospital, we launched Stable. Stable is a digital health platform using live motion analysis in the form of computer vision technology to facilitate a patient's post-operative recovery entirely from home. Using all of the accessible devices they have at home in the form of a laptop, tablet, or even their cell phone, we're able to track their joints while they perform their recovery exercises, analyzing it for their range of motion, exercise adherence, and overall joint biomechanics. We also incorporated patient-reported patient outcome measures and clinical assessment scores to give clinicians a holistic understanding of how that patient's recovery is going while it's entirely being done from home. To date, patients using Stable's platforms have reported over 80% adherence to our recovery protocols, clinical outcome scores 11 points higher than industry average, and have been able to transition at least two follow-up visits to telehealth using the data that we provided their clinician, giving them the comfort to do so over telehealth solutions. We're currently participating in a randomized control trial at NYU Langone, which is showing promising results that stable is equal to, if not better than, traditional in-person physical therapy coming out of orthopedic surgeries. We expect that abstract to be submitted to the academy in the coming months and hoping to be presenting there as well. We're also collaborating with Medicaid hospitals to get this into as many patients' hands as possible, as we are promising accessibility to post-op recovery, not just the bottom line behind it. And we're looking forward to piloting within the VA in the coming months as well, which has been cleared and soon to be rolling out. Unlike traditional solutions out there on the market in the RPM or physical therapy space, Stable is expanding that patient-provider relationship that is built throughout that surgical process. Our commitment to remote monitoring has allowed clinicians to adopt our solution and engage their patients in a more effective way to generate better outcome results. Our insurance reimbursable model has guaranteed alignment between the patient and the provider, allowing them to be rewarded for their time, but also we are committing to reducing the caseload on their end. The nurse on our end does the day-to-day -day monitoring, sending reports to these clinicians, allowing them to not only bill insurance, but having them do so automatically as well by engaging their patients. Dr. Siddiqui was the earliest adopter of one of our solutions and has generated over $12,000 of revenue using Stable. Um, he's not only billed to Medicare, but he's billed to private insurers as well, and we have the data behind that to show that he's growing his practice by onboarding his patients to Stable's platform, but also automating the recovery and building a reputation behind being able to manage recovery patients, um, manage patients recovery entirely remotely and giving them the comfort to do so from home as well. Um, in our earliest cohort of patients with Dr. Siddiqui, we did take a lot of the pre-surgical activity levels, allowing us to prove that Stable is engaging with these patients effectively remotely and really using the general basis of what a total hip or total knee patient would be looking like right now, making sure that we're not just attracting the lowest um, page, age of patients, we're really able to address the needs and the demographics of all of them today. We look forward to answering any of your questions, um, if you have one for us, but thank you so much, guys. All right, our next one. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Thank you. Uh, my name is Kieran McCord. I'm CEO of MoveUp.Care. Uh, we were started by an, an orthopedic surgeon in Belgium, actually, over six years ago. Uh, given he saw the gaps in care from the traditional standard of care and wanted to apply a digital platform. So we've, we've created a digital platform for capturing patient data. And we also um, have the, pl the platform is also available to provide care for patients. We have done all the heavy lifting in terms of uh, regulatory approval. We are FDA registered software as a medical device, CE marked, etc. We've also taken that data and turned it into a predictive analytics model to really help the surgeon make better clinical decisions. So why should you care? Because data is considered the fourth pillar of care. So what we do is we capture 
the patient data seamlessly. We have a wearable low-cost device, actually, which the patient can wear pre- and post-operatively. And with that data, uh, that's fed into the cloud, and uh, the surgeon can and the PTs can work together to ensure that the patient's care is well-managed. We've also proven that with that data, we can empower the surgeon to make better clinical decisions and improve outcomes. We've also applied a little bit of AI to this data. So, for example, where a patient is not moving enough after surgery, the uh, platform can nudge the patient to move more where them, and say, for example, reduce the risk of thrombosis. Where the patient is moving too much and the risk of injury is increased, uh, the platform can nudge the patient to, to move less. So this is the beginning of the sort of AI uh, application in orthopedic uh, digital care, we believe. As a quotation I like there, if uh, your orthopedics company may not be in the software business, but eventually a software company will be in your business. We try to, pra um, to really focus on the practical elements of the, uh, how we can help a surgeon in practice. Um, so we've done some clinical research. Uh, we've shown that uh, by using the practice, uh, by using the system, we can reduce uh, visits by over 80%. Uh, saving, of course, a considerable amount of money, particularly where you have bundled payments. Uh, the system also generates uh, post-operative data, to which can really better predict uh, surgical outcomes. This is probably my favorite example of what the platform can do. So think of this, that the patient has an app, they can take a picture of the, the wound, and that gets triaged up to the, uh, 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 the physical therapist, and then the physical therapist, if they see any issues, um, based on the pain levels, based on the medication that they're seeing from the patient uh, through the uh, in-app medical questionnaires, they can try as that to the surgeon. And that's actually a picture of a surgeon looking at a wound on our system. All of this, of course, is in a software as a medical device system. It's all HIPAA compliant, et cetera. Uh, the other speakers have spoken about the potential for uh, remote therapeutic monitoring revenue. That's something, of course, that we can do as well. These are some of our sort of, if you like, some of our showcasing some of our technology. We can do some of the range of motion and gait analysis. We automatically pick up the six-minute walking test, for example, because the patient is wearing, wearing the, uh, the wearable. Uh, I mentioned the uh, AI treatment there. And then there's a picture of the app in terms of uh, the, what we call the closed loop system. So that essentially, the patient is get, gets uh, exercises based on their, uh, where they are in their treatment. Uh, we capture pain levels, medication, et cetera, giving a full picture for the surgeon in order to actually make better decisions for the next, uh, the next surgery. This is one of our really nice uh, applications here is we call this our move-up index. Essentially, we are able to predict whether a patient would be a good candidate for surgery or not. We, we, make this, we take over 120 data points we analyze that, we put it into an algorithm, and essentially it allows the surgeon to sit down with the patient and say, look, you may, your expectations are misplaced, the surgery may not be suitable for you. And this, of course, is good for the surgeon in the sense that it reduces dissatisfaction, et cetera, um, and improves uh, referrals, et cetera. Finally, we've done a lot of work on the, cl on the clinical validation of the platform, so we published we're publishing an RCT, but we've a lot of papers out there showing, for example, redu reduction in complications, uh, reduction in visits I mentioned, uh, reduction in length of stay, and high compliance. And some patients, 90% uh, of patients say they would do it again. We are in uh, a major hospital systems in Europe. We're just coming to the US uh, this year. Uh, these are just some of the quotations which I like because, uh, th remember, this is a system where you have the surgeons, the PTs, and the patient really working off one platform to improve outcomes. And in this case, the surgeon says, this way we can better predict a patient's post-operative, post-surgery experience, including the occurrence of pain or resuming activities. And then the patient said they would do it again, and the PT sees uh, benefits as well. So in conclusion, very clin it's clinically proven, it's a flexible solution. We are either SaaS or services based. We reduce complications, also very good for proms and AI. Thank you very much. All right, last one. Hooray. Dr. Schuster.
Well, thank you very much, Blaine, and thank you, Stefano, for the uh, opportunity to pitch Upswing Health today. My name is Steve Schutzer. I'm an orthopedic surgeon, CMO, and co-founder of Upswing. And with my partner, Dr. Jay Kimmel, both of us uh, with, have a great experience in clinical practice and a track record of success in building orthopedic centers of excellence. We knew that there's a better way to deliver orthopedic care, and that's why we designed Upswing Health. We also believe that if the metamorphosis of healthcare is to succeed, that primary care needs to be the epicenter of that transformation. And for us as a company to succeed, we're going to have to invisibly integrate interoperably with existing uh, workflows and CRMs. So the orthopedic market is enormous. One in three of us will have an orthopedic incident every year, costing payers $420 billion in annual cost, not to mention the exorbitant cost of loss of productivity. Typically, orthopedics, call an MSK, accounts for the top th one of the top three categories of planned spend. So it's an enormous market, yet unfortunately, 25 to 40 percent of the spend can be attributed to low value, no value, inefficient, uh, inefficiency, and waste. But why? Well, there are many reasons, but one of the prime reasons is when patients have a moment of pain, the first thing out of their mouth is, where do I go for care? And typically today, more often than not, they'll get that care from a primary care physician, an ER, or an urgent care, launching them on the wrong pathway from the very first moment. So something is different. We built a company so patients could have immediate access 24-7 to our symptom assessment algorithms, which duplicates, replicates the kind of relationship I would have with any of you, asks a series of questions, generates a differential, and then offers them several opportunities with self-help tools and rehabilitation techniques. Seven days a week, 12 hours a day, they have access to our, 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 our upswing coaches, and within 24 hours, they can communicate with one of our orthopedic specialists. So we have found that with that, we can resolve 75% of low and medium acuity MSK problems, harmonizing the best of technology with the human touch. The results of a recent pilot, 15-month pilot, we performed the State of Connecticut Health Plan, access to 25,000 patients, showed that the patients that used upswing had 38% fewer encounters than those who don't, and we saved our client $1,100 uh, per, per engaged member. So the MSK space is flush with solutions. We all know that. And why we are different is three ways. One, we provide our patients with immediate access to actionable information about their condition. Two, we launch them on the correct pathway right from the start. And three, with our emerging relationships with national orthopedic practices, we can now manage from end to end, full spectrum, the majority of orthopedic conditions. We are not a point solution. We want to be a full spectrum orthopedic solution. So I thank you, Blaine and uh, Stefano, for that opportunity. All right. Perfect. Thank you. All right, we'll get the groups up and we're going to do a quick questions. Great. Pass this around. We'll start with, uh, as we started, start with Stable. Yep. <laughs> we'll start with you. Do we have one microphone? I'm going to start with Upswing. Can I do that? Sure. Please. Yeah. Um, so, are you going to sell payers? We, tell me about uh, your journey. How is it? How, I love what you're doing. It's next generation telehealth with, with AI focused on a great vertical. Who's buying and why? With what, who's paying for it? Who's paying? Are you going to sell payers? I mean, I could say payers. I can't imagine you selling, um, you know, clinics or doctors directly because it's, you know, disruptive. Yeah. So our, our market currently is, is twofold. One is with the um, self-funded employer space, their ecosystem of employee benefits consultants, brokers and consultants uh, in that self-funded employer space. Of course, in that case, the payers uh, act as a TPA. We're also very interested in working with advanced primary care models. A any, any organization that's taking risk will want, to, will want to work with us. If they're not, they don't. We have primary care relationships, and in fee-for-service primary care, we're viewed as a competitor. But suddenly, when they're taking risks, they're saying, wait, we really can't manage MSK. So um, I follow up uh, with move up then, in order to, uh, to take the right line. Um, 
my question goes into the direction of this pre-operative assessment of the patients, because uh, this is something where we surgeons still feel that we're the best. And you have now 180, if I uh, remember correctly, items where you evaluate whether a patient is already up for surgery or not. Is that correct? We have 120 data points, One, which we can yes. Okay, sorry. Um, so which kind of, of, of items did you choose for that? And how do you, how do you uh, decide whether a patient is already up for surgery? Thinking but, of a patient coming to the, to the outpatients in pain with a hip arthritis, uh, and of course, you want to condition these patients with anemia and, 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 and this stuff, but I can't remember 120 items that I... No, no, so this data is, the patient can, 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 we capture some of the data from the patient, first of all. We, um, we also get the data from, say, imaging and uh, et cetera. So through the algorithm, we're able to, we're essentially trying to manage the patient's expectations, figure out if they're a good candidate or, or not. We come, up, we come up with a scoring system, and if that scoring system from the PROMs and from all the questions cannot be doubled, uh, by the by the surgery, then we do not we recommend the surgery does not go forward. It's not to say that ultimately, you know, it's up to the the two the doctor and, and patient ultimately to decide. But it gives the surgeon a way of communicating with the patient, for example, that they may not be the best candidate for surgery. It's just a, it's a mechanism. So it's it's even more revolutionary than I, than I thought. Yeah. So uh, in which categories do you do have itemized here? Sorry, which which categories which categories you would you would place these items? You you said imaging. There's psychometric uh, questions. There's proms questions. There's imaging. There's X-ray. There's you combine all these things together. We do a score, and then from that score you determine if the patient. I mean, again, it's more about revolution and the, revolutionizing the communication between a patient and a surgeon rather than just making a didactic a recommendation, but for example, we've proven if a patient is over four on the test, I mean, it's still, you know, we're not trying to be, we're not trying to replace the surgeon or anything, but if it's, if they're over four, then they're much more likely to be a good candidate for surgery because their expectations will be doubled by the implant surgery. If they're below that, you're setting it up, setting it up for failure. Interesting. So I'm going to direct um, back actually to upswing. Um, Kind of two questions. One is, um, how, it sounds like you, very interesting concept. By the way, we see so challenging to even get in and get started in the process. A couple month delay with you know to, to get appointments, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, sometimes. Um, <clears throat> so, how many clients do you have right now, and what's the average revenue per client? That's kind of the, the first question. And the second is, if you raise the capital that you were looking to raise. Um, how would you deploy it to achieve how you define success and what is, and what is success to you? That's, that's a great question. Uh, our primary client right now is State of Connecticut Health Plan, so we're managing 225,000 members, which is keeping us quite busy. We also have an OC Health relationship. We have a, a relationship with a primary care practice in Connecticut. We're in 20 states right now. Um, we're really looking to move into the APC, VPC space. Because it's very interesting, and, and this is, we've had these conversations with these primary care practices. You know what they say? You, guys, you, you and Jay are a little different than many orthopedic surgeons. <laughs> I don't know why they say that, but they're a little threatened by interacting with orthopedic surgeons, yet we offer tremendous value for them. They don't really know how to manage MSK. What are we looking for for, for money? We're looking for a 1.5 million interim raise now to get us to Series A. And what would you do with that? How would you deploy that capital? Uh, we uh, are rebuilding our technology. It's a half million dollar investment. We need to finish that. We need to set up in some additional states. We need to hire uh, a chief technology officer. Right now, our technology is being built in France. Um, that's really what it is, and to cover operational costs. Question for Stable. Uh, how do you see your role in triaging? I, I guess there, there's data, there's 143 million musculoskeletal complaints that go unanswered. How do, you, how do you address that market? It seems like it's an open market that surgeons don't see that. Do you, do you find there's an opportunity there? Uh, 
Yeah, for sure. So we started off with our niche in that post-op space and we let our surgeons and kind of like their clinical expertise guide the way we built out the product uh, and the protocols as well. And so that's really allowed us to expedite the way that they're being adopted by the clinician and the patients as well is that they're contributing to the protocol design and they're the ones passing it off to their patients as well, which is allowing us to expand within their clinical coverage and making sure that's being used immediately as opposed to us ineffectively building product and building exercises that will never be adopted by the clinician because they don't have the approval and they really don't want to adopt on their side as well. Can you explain a little bit more about how successful you think the reimbursement model will become? Um, yeah, so for sure. So we've already gotten the data of in, um, reimbursements coming in. Medicare has already been pretty successful and continuous in the way that's being paid out. Um, private insurers, it comes down to, you know, the relationship the patient, ha uh, the clinician has with that insurance company, the way they're being adopted as well. Um, and so we're already collecting which plans and which codes in what states as we continue to look to expand um, to really be intuitive on how that's being adopted. And what documentation do you need for the reimbursement? Um, so we already let the clinician know the timestamp behind it as well, the codes and the time spent on the platform as well. In the event of an audit coming in, they have all the data trail being used along with the engagement with the patient as well. All of that is being facilitated by our platform and our team as well. So it's not adding additional work and caseloads for that clinician as well. Everything's there for them for a data trail and along with the reimbursement side of things, which we notify their team on. All of these companies are incredible. Thank you guys for uh, presenting. I have one other question about upswing. Uh, I was a private practice sports medicine for 25 years, and ATCs are the backbone of what we do, but the number of misdiagnoses from ATCs is staggering. And I noticed on your slide uh, that you mentioned screening by an orthopedic surgeon, but on the slide it said ATC, and I just wanted to clarify that uh, point on who care. Our, who our coaches are? Yeah, it, what's the role of a coach? I thought this was a triage company. Uh, no, we actually manage these conditions as well. Ongoing. You know, it's a little bit misleading because we do triage them in the appropriate care path. But as you know, athletic trainers can't deliver medical advice. So they will review the patient's algorithms, their responses, and guide them on a rehabilitation protocol. And it, what, what's unique is you and I can't check back with the patient every two days. They do. They check back electronically with the patient. How are you doing? They actually look at their exercises, make sure they're performing them right. And then every day, our, our uh, chief clinical officer will then go into their notes and attest that they're staying in their lane. Because you have to be careful about that. But we have, uh, you know, our, our orthopedic specialists are prim primarily primary care sports medicine docs and do a fabulous job. Anything else I could? Thank you very much. I think we're done. Everyone, thank you so much. Great job, guys. Perfect. Great job. Thank you, gentlemen. Outstanding presentation. So we went through the entire ecosystem of innovation, design thinking, funding models, funding a mega ecosystem at the, the, uh, the large economic level down to the perception startups. And then you actually proceed and saw the complexity for these startups. Now, just so you know, each of those startups are going to get the opportunity to present and have their decks reviewed by, I think, uh, Mark, 1,200 venture capitalists on your platform. I think you forgot to mention that. It's one of the huge benefits of these companies having the opportunity to do that. It's awesome. So I'd like to introduce Fabrizio Billy. If you haven't met him before, he's one of our co-hosts for Doc SF. You'll be seeing a lot more of him next two days. But I've asked him to stand in for Dr. Vale because he had to leave. Um, we had our 16th chair uh, uh, awarded yesterday. Hello, so, everybody. Yeah, hello. Hello. Fabrizio, what did you, what three take-homes for you for today? So, I, I mean, I was blown out, uh, you know, blown away. Uh, it started with really a very high note with our first speaker, Mo Mohan, you know, who uh, pretty much told us that uh, you need to embrace fear, and it's a way, the way you manage fear that guides you through innovation, right? And then uh, the whole uh, other speakers is, uh, you know, they, they told, told us, you know, how uh, we, we cannot be uh, fearful of what's coming, right? And although we go to these cycles, as uh, Nancy told us of, up and downs with investment, and maybe it's not the best moment for startup, um, 
Unity told us that, you know, it's actually pretty exciting for some of the technology that are coming to market. That's right. Right? So, and we saw uh, some of it also in the uh, startups that were presented here, the bond. Yeah. So very exciting stuff, I, I, I believe. I agree. And then the, 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 call, the whole is good. So thank you so much. Thank you, guys.